close to that uh, because of the thousands and thousands of decisions that will be made, the inevitable bumps along the road that will be seen and felt, and the difficulties of putting in place some very complex legislation. So this issue of health affairs begins to tackle the hundreds of implementation issues inherent in health reform and offer prescriptions for averting the worst possible outcomes and hopefully getting to the best ones. So that's our 10-year work plan at Health Affairs. And thanks for being with us uh, this morning as we get onto the elevator on the ground floor. Now, health reform, as we know, is all about a lot of differing perspectives. And in the tradition of the famous Kurosawa movie classic Rashomon, these perspectives are very different depending on who has them. We find in this issue that one analyst's celebration of presidential power in the enactment of health reform is another's critique of governmental overreaching. Helen Halpin and Peter Harbage in our issue describe the late lamented life of the public option that they helped to invent, even as others in the issue dance on the public option's grave. So we know there's a wide range of views about health reform, and we're going to be hearing some of those this morning. We expect to hear uh, from expert analysts today about the enormous potential in the law to bend the cost curve. We will also hear from others that it portends a form of fiscal Armageddon at hand. So it's fitting that we'll start this morning with precisely that debate with authors David Cutler and Michael Ramlett. And we will also hear some from the field perspectives from Bruce Hamry of Geisinger Health System and Rich Umdenstock of the American Hospital Association on how they view the curve bending potential and what it will mean for the institutions uh, that will be bearing it out. We're also most pleased this morning that Nancy Ann DePar will be joining us at 9.30 to bring the administration's perspective to bear on implementation issues. And after she speaks, we'll take a break, then reconvene for a panel on the insurance regulations and market reforms in the Affordable Care Act, as well as on the forthcoming insurance exchanges and the temporary high-risk program. And we know that as Troy and Brennan and David Studdert note in their paper in this issue, the insurance market reforms alone will change the nature of the insurance business and confront insurers with a number of difficult decisions, such as whether or not to offer products through the future health exchanges. We're also very delighted that Scott Kiefer, Vice President of America's Health Insurance Plans, will be able to offer some industry perspective on that topic as well. And speaking of exchanges, we know states have a lot to contemplate, including trade-offs between whether to offer consumers a broad selection of products and running the risk of adverse selection or not, as John Kingsdale and John Burko lay out in their very important paper. And then as Deborah Chalet explores in her paper, there are challenges confronting the high-risk pools program, not the least of those being how little funding was made available to meet the likely demand. We're going to hear from Leighton Koo on his paper on Medicaid expansion, and from Alan Weil and Ray Shapak more broadly on issues confronting states. And then Thomas Miller from the Amer for, uh, is here from the American Enterprise Institute. Tom is a true doubting Thomas on the notion of bending the cost curve, among other supposed attributes of health reform, and we'll hear some comment on his paper as well. So as usual, we have a lot of people and a lot of entities to thank for making this issue possible. First of all, a huge thank you to all the authors in this room who put together their analyses and commentary and perspectives in record time since we basically decided to do this issue on March 23rd, uh, and here we are. And in the, in the scholarly publishing world, we will know that that is record time. So could I just ask all the authors in the room to stand up and take a bow? We really do appreciate the work that you've done on the issue. And I think some more will be joining us as the day goes on. Uh, I also want to say a thank you to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, which provided our funding for this issue under our ongoing grant from that foundation. A special word of thanks to Burness Communications for helping us pull together this briefing this morning. And then to the entire health affairs team who is here, who truly burned the midnight oil 
to use a phrase that may not be such a great idea in the contemporary context. Uh, nonetheless, they did do it. Uh, they worked extremely hard on this issue and gave a lot of thought and attention to it. So if I could just have all the health affairs team stand up uh, too, that would be great. Great, thanks so much to all of you. Phil Musgrove, Sarah Dine, Debbie Boylan, who helped to pull together the briefing, Sue Ducat, our uh, Director of Media Relations in the back. Thanks to all of you. So with that, we're going to move to our first panel. Let me ask those panelists to come up and join me up here on the dais, and I'll introduce them more fully now. First, we're going to hear this morning from David Cutler, who is currently the Otto Eckstein Professor of Applied Economics at Harvard where he's also a faculty member at the Kennedy School of Government. He recently finished a five-year term as Associate Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences for Social Sciences. Uh, Professor Cutler served on the Council of Economic Advisors and the National Economic Council during the Clinton administration and was senior healthcare advisor to Barack Obama's presidential campaign. Previously, he had also advised the presidential campaign of Bill Bradley. Among many other affiliations, he held positions with the National Institutes of Health and the National Academy of Sciences, and he's currently a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research, as well as being a member of the Institute of Medicine. We'll then hear from Michael Ramlett, who's a research analyst at the Washington, D.C.-based advisory board company, which provides best practice research, management training, consulting support, and business intelligence technology to hospitals and health systems. He also edits the morning consult, a cross-sector industry briefing for healthcare academics, policymakers, and private sector professionals. He used CBO scores and estimates from Congress's Joint Committee on Taxation to analyze the long-term costs of the new healthcare law, uh, which supported the analytical underpinnings of the paper that he co-authored in our issue with Douglas Holtzegan. Uh, the analysis and the views he expresses today, I will note, are his own and do not reflect the views of the advisory board company. Then we'll hear some perspective from two folks who uh, are very close uh, to those in the field who are thinking about implementation issues, more than thinking about them, getting ready for potentially implementing and certainly uh, trying to figure out what the effects will be on, implement on, uh, on their operations. First, Bruce Hamery, who's Executive Vice President and Chief Medical Officer Emeritus for Geisinger Health System. He's standing in today for Glenn Steele, the CEO of Geisinger, whom I interviewed, and who, uh, the interview with whom appears in our issue of Health Affairs. Uh, Bruce's current responsibilities include Geisinger's research institutes, as well as leading Geisinger's efforts to extend its innovations in healthcare delivery and payment to other groups and health systems. He previously led Geisinger's 740 physician group practice and clinical activities in three hospitals. He was also formerly executive director of Penn State University Hospitals and chief operating officer of the Milton S. Hershey Medical Center, as well as a professor and associate dean for clinical affairs at Penn State's College of Medicine. And so we're very happy to have Bruce with us this morning as well. And finally, Rich Undenstock, who's president and chief executive officer of the American Hospital Association, has been kind enough to join us as well. The AHA leads, represents, and serves more than 5,000 member hospitals, health systems, and healthcare organizations, as well as 40,000 individual members. Rich's career includes experience in hospital administration, health system leadership, association governance and management, HMO governance, and healthcare governance consulting. He's written several books and articles for the hospital board audience and its health research and educational trust, and for the American College of Healthcare Executives, for which he serves as a fellow. He is also on the National Quality Forum Board of Directors and the National Priorities Partnership and chairs the Hospital Quality Alliance. So with that, let me turn things over to David Cutler to get us going this morning on the subject of health reform. Will it bend the cost curve? And David's response is, it must. David. Thank you, Susan. Good morning, everyone. How are you? Good. Um, first off, congratulations on a, a, a terrific issue and put together in, in record time. So it's really it's really um, f phenomenal. You know, the, the analogy I was thinking about um, is less uh, the oil spill, God forbid, than the TV show Lost. So you may uh, all of us feel 
like uh, we are lost in all of this and we want to know what's happening. And at one level, we've had some resolution, which is that after, depending on your choice, two years or eight decades of debate, we finally reached some resolution on health care. And of course, uh, at the other level, lost was a uh, six year series and health care reform is likely to be uh, six years or longer in terms of figuring out whether um, whether, whether people wind up uh, happy in the afterlife or wishing they were back on the island. And so what I want to do is indicate why I hope there is a happy afterlife. Uh, let me start off with why, of course, there must be a happy afterlife, which is that, um, you know, and I will stretch the analogy for one more second, which is that if the afterlife isn't very fun, then it sort of diminishes all the things that came before it. So um, let me put it, let me sort of translate, which is to say that health reform will only be successful if it can successfully bend the cost curve. If it can, then we will be able to afford the commitments we've made under the legislation, as well as the commitments that were already in place through Medicare and Medicaid. And if we cannot bend the cost curve, then not only will the new commitments we made fail, but the older commitments to Medicare and Medicaid and a variety of other programs will fail as well. And we know that from look, any cursory look at the federal budget will tell you that. So the success or failure of health care and health reform will be determined to a great extent by what this legislation does about cost issues. Now actually, um, for all the talk about uh, scattershot nature of reform and all of that, there actually is a philosophy that underlies reform. I will tell you what it is and I'll give you some projections. And I, I guess I'll just say by way of starting, I, I think the right way to view this now is not as a kind of he said, she said, or, he, or this team said, that team said in the sense of what is likely to happen. But what I want to do is leave you with a sense of how will you know when reform is actually working? So what are the things that you can look at that will tell you whether reform is happening? So let me give you a little bit of the philosophy, and I want to draw an analogy to um, industries outside of healthcare and say, what is it that makes industries be successful in the sense that they are high value, high productivity, low cost? And if you look across all the management literature, you basically see there are three things. Number one is very successful industries use information technology a lot. So they know what they're doing, who's doing it, why they're doing it, who's the right person to do it, how long it's taking, how much it costs, everything about, a, uh, everything about the nature of production. Of course, in healthcare, the most um, interesting thing is that we know essentially none of that. Uh, and when we do observe it, um, we uh, observe that it's bad. So we have nurses doing a third of their time documenting things. We have doctors spending a third of their time documenting things. We have production costs that are 20 to 30 to 40% higher than they need be. So every time you look at it, it, every time we gather information, we discover that we're doing less well than we think. The first thing that the administration did over a year ago was to put in place a mechanism where we'll be able to gather the information we need. So the first step of health reform was actually well over a year ago in the Recovery Act, the High Tech Act part of the Recovery Act, which was spent $30 billion to computerize the healthcare industry, it's estimated that about 90% of physicians and 70% of hospitals will be hospitalized with, will be computerized within the next decade. So that's the first thing. The second thing that um, productive industries do is they have compensation arrangements that are oriented towards value. That is, they provide economic rewards for doing the right thing, okay? Not for doing the AIG thing, not for, doing the, uh, not for doing the wrong thing in other ways, but for doing the right thing. And in fact, the vast bulk of what the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act was about, if you look by pages, the vast bulk of the pages, or the weight of the bill, or any other metric you choose to look at, was about changing compensation arrangements, starting with the Medicare program, working out from there. I'll give you a little bit more detail in just a second to think about moving away from paying for volume, which as we know creates more volume, to paying for value, which as we believe will lead to more value. Okay, so that's the second thing. And then the third thing that every um, 
uh, every successful industry does is they work with employees and they work with consumers. Think about Amazon.com and other online retailers. They work with employees and consumers to make the production process be better. And we see this again in healthcare. If you look at the successful healthcare organizations, they are not very hierarchical. They use, they, they empower the workers within them and they take advantage of the consumers, the patients, to help improve the quality of things. That's what every industry does. That's what every successful industry does. Think about in retail trade, uh, Walmart, up through Amazon, through Southwest Airlines, every single productive business. So that's basically what's got to happen. If you say what to look for, I would look for those three things happening, better information, a, a better compensation system, and it actually in empowering of people who really know what they're doing. Let me talk for a minute about what the compensation part is about, and let me give you sort of the highlight of what, um, what it is the bill is trying to do. The, the basic philosophy behind the bill is that the problem with healthcare is that it's too siloed and it's not coordinated enough. So if you think about a person who's healthy and goes through chronic illness and acute illness and post-acute care, Every time they're in one of those boxes, they wind up in some sub box. So they get seen by a primary care physician or a specialist physician, or they're treated in a hospital, or they have a lab, or they have a pharmacy use. Most of the problems in healthcare come when people leave one box and go to another. So you're in the hospital, you go out of the hospital, no one ever tells the primary care doctor, you wind up back in the hospital in three weeks. The average rate of that in the country is 20% in Geisinger Healthcare, it's 6%. Why is it 6%? Because they figured out how to make sure that when you go from one box to another, you're not leaving the system. So what we do currently in healthcare is we think about it as a series of boxes. No patient cares about boxes, it's not associated with good care. The way that you'll get good care is by grouping all of those boxes together in some ways, and there's two ways to think about doing that. The first way is through bundling some kind of payment. I've shown you here a bundle for chronic uh, care payment, which is just simply to say, we're going to literally draw a box around the whole thing, and we're going to bring you all the components of that. If that sounds, by the way, a little bit like what Walmart did to retail, the analogy is quite apt, and you should think about it that way, or what Amazon.com did to online sales. It's by trying to put some structure on the system so that you can make the components fit together. Think about new models here not about changes in existing payments but entirely new models the other way to um, think the other way to think about it is to say well we're going to take what's happening in one box and we're going to attribute it to another box so we'll say for physicians for primary care physicians if you do a better job successfully managing the patient then you'll get more money through a medical home type payment or other kind of care transition type arrangement that's again trying to break down these boxes so one way or another we need to break down these boxes it is estimated that about 30% of all the medical services provided are not doing much good. So that's about 30% savings. And then in addition to that, there are prices that are too high. There are administrative expenses that go on throughout the system. I'm sure Rich can tell us enormous amounts about them. That uh, 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 my own sense is that probably about 40 to 50% of everything that happens in medical care wouldn't happen in an efficient system. So I've tried to sketch out what moving to efficiency would mean. And I don't mean cutting payments here. I'm not talking about Medicare cutting payments. I'm talking about actually making the system work more efficient. Or to ask the question this way, how long would it take an industry that really wanted to be efficient to go from hopelessly bad to efficient? Think about the answer in your head for a minute. How long would it take an industry to go from awful to much better? How many of you say less than five years? How many say five to 10 years? How many say 10 to 15 years? How many say more than 15? Well, you all are more optimistic than I am. This is what would happen to medical costs if it took 20 years to become more efficient. Medical savings, this is what would happen. We'd save about uh, half a trillion dollars in the first decade and then building from there. This is, as I said, taking out about 30% of costs over 20 years. Enormous potential for savings. This doesn't even get to all of what we know are the amount of waste in the system. Um, and I take it from this audience that I should actually have speeded this up some and showed you savings uh, much sooner. Not, this won't happen by magic. It's gonna take a lot of hard work and the hard work will be of two forms. 
First, there will be an administrative component. Just to give you a sense of numbers, my sense was always that getting from where we were to healthcare transition, about 10% of that would be legislative effort. Another 25% will be administrative effort in Washington. The biggest issue is going to be to figure out how to take all the new authorities and make them work. And the current way of doing that involves a lag time of about 10 years, which is way too long. So we're going to need a, a new process of operating the federal government. That is, we're going to have, to borrow a phrase, um, a health department on steroids. And there's going to have to be an openness to new approaches. As I said, the thing about healthcare is not going to be doing the same thing but paying less for it, but rather doing different things and new ways of doing it. But then the remaining 65%, I think, is going to be the kind of block and tackling day-to-day -day activities going on within the provider community to change the existing forms of organization, to develop new organizational models that really think about caring for the patient as a whole and saying, how can we do well by this patient and lower the expenses and to really develop, to, to really undergo what every other industry in the economy has gone through. And it really is every other industry. In the US as a whole, productivity growth was about 1% until the mid-1990s. It then increased by about 1.5 percentage points a year to about 2.5% from the mid-1990s till now. And the reason it did it is because of those things I showed you. Because we had the information and structures, we had the right reward system, and we empowered the employees and consumers. If healthcare does the same thing, it'll move from being one of the laggard industries in the economy, defining the bottom, to one of the best industries in the economy. And maybe it'll make the entire 80 years worth of wait worth it. I'm going to stop there. Thank you, Susan, for the introduction. I appreciate the invitation to be here on such a distinguished panel. Unfortunately, my co-author, Douglas Holtzikin, cannot be here. Uh, looks like Steven Strasberg and I will both be making our debuts today. <laughs> Oh, come on, that was more funny. Uh, well, I'm unable to speak with the same depth on the inner workings of the Congressional Budget Office, I can detail for you the underlying anal analytical framework of our analysis. In light of the fiscal threat from growing spending, the budgetary impacts of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act are central to any discussion of its merits. As you can see in the slide here to our left, or to my left to your right, in, the broad, terms over the in broad terms over the next 30 years, revenues, which are depicted by the bold black line, are dramatically outpaced by federal outlays, which you can see in the shaded region on the graph. According to the CBO analysis, the deficit will never fall below $700 billion in the next 10 years. This is not a pretty fiscal picture. Today I'll focus on the bottom portion of this slide, first covering the CBO estimates, and then discussing why we believe these estimates are overly optimistic. As you can see, if everything in the recently passed Health Care Act goes according to plan, there is a projected decline in the deficit of $124 billion over the first 10 years, and $681 billion as we extrapolated in the second 10 years using CBO compound annual growth rates. This does little to alleviate or counteract the rise in federal outlays, as we saw on the previous slide. Just last week, Congressional Budget Office Director Douglas Elmendorf stated, rising health costs will put tremendous pressure on the federal budget during the next few decades and beyond. In CBO's judgment, the health legislation enacted earlier this year does not substantially diminish that pressure. That's a direct quote from the CBO director as it was presented to the Institute of Medicine last week. What has to be the most concerning thing about healthcare reform is that it doesn't just fail to alleviate the budget pressure, it threatens to intensify it. We address four dubious budgetary provisions in the CBO estimates. One, unachievable cost savings. Two, unscored budget effects. Three, uncollectible revenue, and four, already reserved premiums. Taking these into account, the end result would raise, not lower, federal deficits by $554 billion in the first 10 years and $1.4 trillion in the second 10 years. All four scenarios have either been caveated by the Congressional Budget Office in their final report and letters to members of Congress or have strong prior historical precedent. 
The first scenario, unachievable cost savings, removes spending cuts that we believe CMS will ultimately be unable to implement. These are updates to the Independent Payment Advisory Board, Medicare Advantage interactions, and the lower Part D premium subsidy for, for high income beneficiaries. Although the specifics of each differ, these provisions share two features. First, the Act itself does not automatically reform Medicare in such a manner that will permit it to operate at lower budgetary costs. Second, when the time comes to implement these savings or those developed by the Independent Payment Advisory Board, CMS will be faced with the possibility of strongly limited benefits, the inability to serve beneficiaries, or both. As a result, the cuts will be politically infeasible as Congress is likely to continue to regularly override scheduled reductions. The amounts of 254, this amounts to $254 billion over the first 10 year period. The second scenario, unscored budgetary effects, highlights acknowledged costs that are, that are not included in the CBO score. To operate the new health care programs over the first 10 years, future Congresses will need to vote for $274.6 billion in additional spending. This is unbudgeted spending uh, that includes discretionary costs of $210 billion for the Medicare Physician Payment Reform Act, which would revise the sustainable growth rate for physician reimbursement, $50 billion in explicitly authorized health care grant programs, which I believe since we've done this analysis was updated in the most recent letter to Congress on May 11th to include $105 billion in explicitly funded grant programs with specific funding levels and $15 billion in administrative costs for, IRS, for the IRS and CMS. These are costs which must be included but could not be scored until the act was passed. Scenario three, uncollectible revenue. Questions the political will of Congress and directly refers to the excise tax on high premium Cadillac health plans. This tax was supposed to start immediately according to the Senate's version of the reform law after intense lobbying by organized labor, Congress relented and pushed the tax back to 2018. We have strong reason to believe it will likely be abandoned or pushed back again at that time. This amounts to another 780, or excuse me, $78 billion. Scenario four, premiums reserved. Focuses on the Community Living Assistance and Services and Supports Act the class act as it's probably more familiar to most of you, premiums for long-term care insurance. While receipts for the class act contribute to short-term deficit reduction, they will be paid out in full over the next two or three decades. Therefore, this should not be considered deficit reduction. Accounting for this discrepancy adds 70 billion to the score in the first 10 years. So what's the bottom line? We're facing we were facing a pending fiscal crisis before reform. The Patient and Protection, and, or the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, which was sold as deficit reduction, can only deliver modest deficit reduction if everything goes well. And now, we're likely facing a more intense budget crisis, given that the Act's dubious budget provisions raise, not lower, federal deficits by 554 billion in the first 10 years, and 1.4 trillion over the succeeding 10 years. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'd like to move from 100 miles up and a large view of the federal deficit down to a much more discreet problem, which is how doctors and patients interact um, and how patients receive care in a community. Because at the end of the day, this is where the action is that impacts all these projections. And so with that in mind, um, I'd like to uh, take professors Professor Cutler's um, schematic of how industries work, uh, speak for about two minutes on how we have implemented those sorts of things at Geisinger and the effect that has had both on patients and on the budget, and then talk about two minutes on what I see going on around the country in other health systems and uh, physician groups. So if we take uh, Professor Cutler's uh, model of successful industries uh, and use of healthcare IT, 
uh, Geisinger, which is a regional health information system in the mountains of Pennsylvania, uh, implemented uh, HIT in 1995. Uh, we are fully electronic for 800 physicians, 400 mid-levels, uh, over uh, 2 million patients, and patients can access that medical record or their parts of it from anywhere in the world that there's a website. Now, uh, what we have seen with the way that's implemented is that physicians are, are spending uh, not 30, uh, they're not spending 30 percent of their time documenting. Uh, we don't have to repeat tests. Patients don't have to be asked repetitively, where do you live? Why are you here? Right? Um, we've also, with federal money, uh, begun to extend that, in, uh, extend that capability out into the community to other physicians, other hospitals, and other patients. So we're down the road on that. Compensation systems, uh, we changed physician comp uh, in 2000. Our physicians uh, have about 20% of their total compensation in incentives. Half of that is for quality. Uh, our primary care folks, in addition, receive funds through, for medical home and other things which focus their attention on the management of patients with chronic disease and keeping them out of the hospital where nobody wants to be anyway. So it's not, a, not an adversarial thing. And last, in terms of working with patients and consumers to improve quality of care, I would say that's still a work in process. We're still trying to, uh, to figure out how best to engage patients and consumers in their own health care, because after all, 99.9-something .9 percent of the time, they're responsible for their own decisions about lifestyle, diet, do I get my medicines and take them, and all those other sorts of things. And, and so that's still very much a work in progress for us. But I would tell you that with those emphases and with discrete redesign of care, for medical home and for use of HIT, um, as was commented, what we've seen over the last three years, both in uh, now 35 Geisinger primary care sites and six uh, non-Geisinger primary care sites that are aligned with our insurance company, uh, we have seen uh, a 14% drop in admission rates to hospitals among Medicare beneficiaries a 22% drop in readmissions for Medicare beneficiaries, uh, and overall a 7 to 8% drop in medical cost trend, uh, which has been sustained now for three years. So I think we can show evidence that the cost curve can be bent with attention, with redesign, with involvement of patients. I would simply point out to, uh, I think all of you in the room, hospitals are not places where people want to go. Uh, those of us who own or run hospitals sometimes think they are, uh, but they're really not. And so if you can provide a better venue for that care, uh, and, and part of this is by having nurses who are uh, trained as case managers of living and working in the primary care site, so that they bridge those white spaces between home and hospital, hospital and nursing home, and all that, and sync up things like medications, make sure that the patient has an appointment to see their physician within five days after discharge. Those things have measurable impact. So what I see going on around the country in terms of the physicians is, first, interest in some of these possibilities. Second, a great deal of confusion about what's coming down the road. The law is clear, but the regulations have not, uh, have not been written. Uh, I've been in some meetings in the last week where people are saying, well, gee, there are going to be 100 pages of regulations for every one of those 2,080 pages of law. So expect a big, a big stack. So I think we're waiting for, for all that. But I think there is excitement in a number of healthcare systems and physician groups around the country about the opportunities offered in the new law 
to really fundamentally redesign the way that we deliver health care so that we make it better for patients, better for doctors, and we use some of those dollars that Professor Cutler and others have pointed out are currently wasted on rework, administration, whatever, uh, in a more useful way, and hopefully thereby uh, without having to uh, get us to the point of being Greece. Thank you. Well, good morning, and thank you again, Susan, for the opportunity to be here. As uh, Susan and I were chatting just before we got started, um, I tend to view all of this as chapter one. Uh, it's a big chapter. There's no question about it. But this is not the end of our health reform journey by any stretch. It's obviously just the beginning. And as we look at this law and its provisions, we're going to have to understand how much change we're going to have to make uh, even before parts of it get implemented but certainly more change to come following it because it doesn't address uh, all of the aspects that'll get us to the ideal system uh, that uh, David was talking about. Now, a um, couple, of, couple of things to uh, uh, start with. Uh, one is why did the American Hospital Association support the bill? Uh, and just to uh, refresh people's memory, we've been uh, as AHA been calling for reform of the system for literally decades, starting in the 70s, uh, certainly tried to put forth a vision of a coordinated framework uh, at the time in the 90s called a community care network, and now again uh, came down squarely in favor of reform, looking for major elements in these five areas, or at least major progress in these five areas. Certainly coverage being uh, a paramount, uh, has been at the forefront of our issues for a long time. And to cut to the bottom line about why we supported it, uh, I tell people there are only 32 million reasons why we supported it. Uh, now we do have to make sure that we figure out how to make it work. But that was our starting point. And we also said, unlike some, uh, we said it's going to be paid for by all. Uh, there's no way out of this. The answer to who pays for health care is we do. We pay for it now, we'll pay for it in the future. We don't pay for it as efficiently as we should. We certainly don't pay for it at the levels that we'd all like to see. But at the end of the day, we pay for it. So it's in all of our interests to marshal all of our forces from whatever position we play in this equation to help bend that curve. Uh, we would note that for providers, and this is, gets to the incentive question that David started with, um, the incentive is for volume. The incentive is to treat. It's not to maintain and keep out of the system. And so we've got to turn those incentives around. Or said differently, we have to give some sort of business case for wellness. And so that's going to be, you know, we've made a start, but we've got more to do in that regard. That should help, along with other things, other changes in incentives, get us to the efficiency or affordability question, the bending the curve question. And certainly in major provisions of the bill, uh, we do start down that road of changing those incentives. But again, if anybody had the answers to exactly how to do it on day one, I think it might have been in a bill or a proposal. But we're uh, looking at the demonstrations and, and pilot efforts to be sure we know what we're doing and how to get there. But would agree, we've got to change those incentives. Quality has to improve. I think the case between quality and cost has now been made very clearly in the last certainly the last five years, uh, and uh, we've just got to continue to improve quality, improve safety, reduce unnecessary care or reduce in, in care and uh, improve that for the patient's sake, but also, again, for the cost sake. And then lastly, best information. How do we move information to the point of clinical and patient decision making? Physicians and patients need that information at the point of decision making, need to know what the options are, need to know what the contraindications are. And you can only do that in, in a volume of information that uh, healthcare represents through electronic means. And uh, uh, I've had the opportunity to work in a very large geographically integrated system and know the value of that. But we have to figure out how to come to those agreements, whether it's over a geography or even just between hospitals and physicians or acute and post-acute as to what systems we'll use and how we'll connect the IT system. Now you can tell I'm not an IT guru because my example is my phone system. I like my phone for one reason. 
it rings outside the house. I can call somebody. If I only ring inside the house, it's an intercom. We're building intercoms. Vendors are producing intercoms at best. Some of them don't even connect between the outpatient and the inpatient side. We've really got to work on how to connect IT, and it's no small issue. But we're pleased to see the start that's been made, and we have hope on the meaningful use regulations. So we supported the bill, and we'll go through all of this, because major elements of it fall right in line with the framework that we were promoting. And so from coverage to starting that case for uh, wellness to affordability quality, and then in the gold or yellow box, IT, which came out of the stimulus bill, has been pointed out. So if you take that all together, I think we've made a substantial start. What does it mean for hospitals, and how are hospitals responding? Well, before this even began, certain trends were already clearly underway in the hospital field. One is more integration. There's more horizontal integration, consolidation, hospital to hospital. There's more acute to post-acute consolidation or connection. And there's more hospital to physician connection going on than ever before. Uh, just taking one element of that, uh, the employment of physicians uh, happening more and more with hospitals every day for a variety of reasons. The second trend that was already underway is to be more at financial risk and to be able to, to understand that it won't just be pay for volume and that there will be questions. The immediate questions obviously have to do with uh, hospital associated conditions, uh, non-payment for so-called uh, serious reportable events or as it's been shorthanded, never events. Uh, those risks are already underway. Now we'll escalate the level of risk through bundle payments or uh, some sort of population-based payment. But that trend is underway. And the third trend that's been underway is accountability. Uh, more transparency, more public reporting than ever before. Uh, today, virtually all hospitals, certainly all of the PPS hospitals and many of the critical care access hospitals uh, uh, report against the nationally agreed upon uh, process outcome efficiency and satisfaction indicators that are on hospital compare and are ramping that up all the time. So those three trends were already underway. But as we look at the impact of the bill, I think it will only speed those trends. I think hospitals will, uh, are already focused on the notion that it's going to be a performance-driven future. On the cost side, I run into more members every day who have picked Medicare as the bogey, you know, kind of this is what I've got to, I've got to be able to live within Medicare rates because it's not going to get a whole lot better, if at all. And how do we do that? We've also got uh, performance orientation, certainly around the quality and safety efforts. And I'll talk about a couple of national engagement strategies that are already underway and the results we're getting. Uh, and people are, are very much engaged now in the whole issue of throughput and systems engineering, uh, a field that's really only been introduced in healthcare in the last several years, but is really gaining momentum. You often hear about it through Lean and Six Sigma and so on but robust process improvement, as in other industries. What the AHA is trying to do is, is model out for members uh, what the major implications of the bill are in the upper left, what the follow through is going to be in the upper right in terms of regulation, in terms of the various uh, pilots and demos, uh, the panels that uh, are gonna guide some of this and so on. So we've built that out on a website. And then down the bottom, an effort that we call Hospitals in Pursuit of Excellence, uh, which is all about performance improvement and trying to help um, deepen, uh, broaden and deepen those performance improvement efforts that are already underway across the country and accelerate the uptake on known uh, tools and techniques that can help improve systems and improve outcomes. Uh, the next shot is just simply of a website that I call your attention to for HPOE that you can go to. There are a growing body of resources on there, uh, in addition to publications like these around um, key topics, current topics, uh, avoidable readmissions, uh, workforce issues, bundled payments, and so on. Uh, there are also now a growing body of case studies from individual hospitals in a standardized format with contact information as to who's done what, how they've solved a particular problem, and how other hospitals can adopt uh, that, uh, those proven techniques. Speaking of which, uh, we've been very involved with 
uh, funding from ARC to help push out nationwide uh, a set of proven te uh, techniques and, and a specific tool, the checklist that has been made famous uh, under the work of Peter Pronovost and the Michigan Hospital Association's Keystone Center. We now have a grant from ARC to take that nationwide. <clears throat> to date, we've uh, signed up and partnering with 28 states. We have now over 600 hospitals reporting all central line associated infections from any unit in the hospital, not just intensive care units. And uh, preliminary information starting to show that the rate of incidence is going down significantly. And of course, our goal is to get it down to zero, certainly under one per thousand line days uh, as fast as we can. And there's a 30 or $40,000 estimated savings in each one of those avoided uh, infections. We also have a smaller grant hoping to build on that one too around catheter-associated urinary tract infection. So by the end of the year, our goal is to have several thousand hospitals reporting on all of these uh, infections and the eradication thereof. Lastly, as I said, uh, still some work to be done. We have some concerns about the bill. We think the readmissions provision is based on bad policy. Uh, there are readmissions, that, there are second admissions within a 30-day period that are justified. Law doesn't look at that. Hospital acquired conditions, uh, there are uh, double and triple penalties for the same incident. We'd like to see that straightened out. We want to be sure that the dish payments and the coverage uh, increases are linked up because there'll still be, by estimates, 23 or 24 million people uninsured at the end of this. And a variety of other things that didn't get addressed in there, several of which affect hospitals' cost of doing business, which is another part of helping to bend that cost curve. So thank you very much. All right, well, thanks to all of you. Well, just to recap what we've heard, we started out hearing from David that health reform is only going to be successful if it does bend the cost curve. If not, we're not gonna be able to meet the commitments promised in the Affordable Care Act, let alone all the ones promised from 1965 on in Medicare and Medicaid and so on. And he said, we will know that reform is working and the potential for cost curve bending is being realized if we see the industry in effect taking up everything that currently efficient industries have taken up, information technology, incentives for doing the right thing, uh, orientation toward process improvement, movement away from fragmentation, depressing, uh, depressing administrative expenses and taking out all unnecessary cost, et cetera. And if we seize all of the opportunities in the law to do that, uh, David's feeling is we will get 30% of the costs out of the system over a 20 year period. So that's, a, I guess we would call that the, if not the optimistic view, the we can do it view. Uh, Michael Ramlett, by contrast, and Doug Holtzik and his co-author uh, assume that we cannot do that. Uh, in fact, I would say, to move from, we had, it, let's see, analogies this morning to the movie Lost, or the TV show Lost, and also the Gulf oil spill. Let's introduce a more middle American analogy, Prairie Home Companion, and Powder Milk Biscuits, which, as we know, give us the strength to get up and do what needs to be done. Uh, David is, in fact, saying industry will have the strength to get up and do what needs to be done and eat those biscuits. Michael Ramlett says, no chance, <laughs> no chance. Uh, in effect, uh, that the cost savings will be unachievable, uh, that there are a number of unbudgeted costs in the legislation that we're now becoming aware of, that we'll never have the guts to impose the uh, tax on high premium health plans, and that we should have put a lockbox in effect around the class act provisions uh, because to pretend otherwise uh, is not fair. And therefore, we'll end up raising deficits by $554 billion over five years as opposed to lowering them. We heard then from Bruce that uh, the powder milk biscuits have been eaten, at least to some degree, at Geisinger, that the cost curve was bent, at least in terms of the care of Medicare beneficiaries, to the tune of 7 to 8 percent. Keep in mind that we're, we're talking nationally about getting to a target where we bend uh, the cost curve uh, by 1.5 percent over uh, several decades, and at Geisinger, they managed seven to eight. So uh, it turns out that powder milk biscuits go down very well if you eat them. Uh, and that includes implementing health information technology, 
paying physicians differently, having different compensation systems, engaging in ongoing process improvement, even if Geisinger hasn't quite perfected the notion of getting individuals to wake up and smell the coffee, uh, to introduce another metaphor, and realize that they have a role in preserving their own health. And then we heard from Rich that, uh, again, I think the gist of your comments, Rich, are that the hospital sector believed that it had to eat the biscuits. <laughs> there really was no alternative. Uh, that it was willing to do that in order to get 32 million more people covered and therefore get hospitals paid, which is always a better idea than not paying them for the care that they deliver. Uh, and that the quality has to improve uh, and they're committed to making it improve. That information has to be expanded and they're committed to doing that. And that the law will speed a number of the trends already underway. Uh, driving us to more integration, more systems taking on financial risk, more accountability, et cetera. So notwithstanding some improvements that could be made in the legislation, uh, the AJ is behind it and is willing to believe uh, or take the bet that it, we can bend the cost curve with the tools in place in the law. So I guess, Michael, it's not as if we set out to stack the deck here with three in favor of the biscuits and you against, but in fact, that's what's occurred. So let me ask you first to respond to uh, what, what you've heard this morning, which is that those actually in the field think this can be achieved and are therefore more optimistic about the results than you are. Well, I think the first point I'd like to make is that in my current work in the field is that I've had an opportunity to speak with a number of the demonstration programs, uh, the finance senior staff at those programs. I think what we've tried to make the point is that we don't disagree that there isn't waste in the system. I think there's tremendous waste in the system. I think that's generally agreed by most professionals in the community. I think what we're trying to assert with our analysis is that we're not able to get after that waste or that waste was not the focus of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. And I think that's a position that's been supported by actual members of the administration. A week after we submitted our analysis, the chief actuary of CMS, Richard Foster, released his own report, uh, which similarly corroborates the fact that $251 billion uh, seems to be the more likely impact against the deficit and not reducing the deficit. I think that the programs are incredibly promising related to bundle payment, but they don't start the bundle payment pilot for another three years. And simply put, there's extraordinary organizations like Geisner that have unique cultures, that have integrated delivery systems, and have had major strides at reducing costs, but that just simply isn't easy to implement across the system, and we haven't focused on reforming Medicare and CMS in a way that we can take those demonstration projects out. I think David noted in his paper, it currently takes nine to 10 years for CMS to roll out the advancements of a pilot project. That simply shouldn't be the case, and we can't continue to raise over a trillion dollars in subsidies and then assume that we're going to have savings somewhere, somewhere down the road. I just don't think we have time. David, you want to respond to that? Um, well, I thought we were in inching towards four to nothing, <laughs> given Michael's um, comments. I, I guess I'd, I, um, I don't disagree about the need to speed it up at all. I think the current tenure process probably has to get closer to 10 month process than 10 years. I, I agree we don't have the time to waste. I guess the, the real issue and the one that goes, that I, I try and think about in my mind is how replicable are the good examples? So we have a number of very good examples. We have the Geisinger is obviously in the top tier of good examples. Kaiser and Group Health Cooperative, the Mayo Clinic, the Cleveland Clinic, we all know the examples, we have a number of them. And the question is, are they replicable or are they not? And in, a, in the field of education research, you know, what's known is that they're good teachers and bad teachers and nobody's figured out how to turn bad teachers into good teachers and so that's the model that gives you pause. And in the other industries that I was talking about, retail and airlines and banking and so on, having one very efficient firm in spurred all the other firms to become more efficient or else they got out of business. And one way or the other, the whole industry transformed itself. And so I, I, my belief is that we're ultimately in the second kind of situation where we really can do the transformation that, no offense to Bruce, that there's nothing unique about the water in central Pennsylvania that makes th that be the one of the few places in the universe that can do this um, but that really we but that really it can it can spread and if we 
provide the right incentives and the right tools, then, then it will. And just to follow up on that, Bruce, in, in my interview with Glenn Steele, he noted that one of the possibilities Geisinger is engaged in talking with others about is linking up these very efficient systems nationwide, the Kaiser Permanentes, the Geisingers, the Mayos, et cetera, to offer, in effect, what would be a national health plan that would be attractive to national employers uh, who might be locating in various sites around the country. That sounds to me like the kind of competitive system that David is just describing. It's, it's like having a Southwest Airlines come into the airline market and force everybody else to do things differently. Is, do you think that's where we're going to end up? Well, I think Dr. Steele's comments were, is this one? Yeah. Um, I, I think Dr. Steele's comments were really related to the fact that uh, part of health care reform is clearly to allow uh, many more people access to insurance. And currently, most of the provider-sponsored not-for-profit plans, Tufts, Geisinger, Carl Clinic, so forth and so on, uh, Group Health, are uh, regional. And so we all have an issue with the large national purchasers who tend to go for a national plan. And so one of the byproducts of that uh, is uh, a, an early uh, discussion among some of those groups about is it possible to have some arrangement whereby a Geisinger patient uh, who needs health care in California can get that at a reasonable rate. Now, if a Geisinger patient, a Geisinger health plan patient, uh, health plan accounts for under a third of our total group, by the way. So, but if one of our health plan patients is hospitalized in California, we're paying uh, sort of rack rates, uh, uh, premium rates, at whatever that hospital is, and vice versa, uh, say for Kaiser. And so is there a way to do something uh, like that? But it, yes, it would inject um, competition in the insurance market. I think uh, the difficulty with healthcare delivery as opposed to airline industries or banking is that healthcare is very local. And so uh, even if someone like a Cleveland Clinic or a Mayo or somebody else does a particular uh, uh, bundle price for cardiac surgery or neurosurgery or something else, that does not have a major impact, or at least in the past, has not had a major impact on overall health care delivery or costs in the country. Uh, an arrangement uh, uh, that Dr. Steele was talking about with you might, in the sense that it would bring uh, more, more focus on pricing. It, it, yeah, it's hard to imagine that if you linked up a bunch of systems that have already shown that they can bend the cost curve, that some interesting competitive pressures wouldn't result. Rich, how do, how do you see this? Again, you seemed more optimistic on the notion of recognizing that there will be considerable pain and transformation in your industry, that this has got to be done. Well, I think there'll be pain for all of us. Um, uh, you know, we're, we're talking about nothing short of changing uh, a huge part of our national culture. You know, how we approach health and health care in this country is, you know, runs very deep. And everybody um, wants to see change. I'm not sure that everybody wants to change that much. And we're going to learn that lesson along the way. So if it doesn't bend the cost curve enough, that's why I say this is chapter one. The nation will be back at this debate in the future. Now, David used a, a very key word in describing uh, Geisinger, which is a unique system, a unique culture. It's a group of physicians who've decided to practice in a particular fashion, in a particular configuration, which is showing results. How many physicians nationally want to practice or have, have been through their professional lives practicing in that sort of system? Or, pick on my own members, how many hospitals? Uh, today, about two-thirds are part of large, uh, larger systems, two or more hospitals, some regional, some multi-state, but still not all hospitals. So we're still, as, a, as an industry, figuring out where the, the sweet spot is on standardization, economies of scale, and so on. Uh, but I think also for, for us as individuals, and I, I do this jokingly, obviously, but we have to think about what our consumption framework or culture is. And I always ask people, 
if they have three forms of coverage, do you have homeowners, do you have life insurance, and do you have health insurance? And I asked them, if you have homeowner's insurance and you paid a lot of money last year for that, were you disappointed that your house didn't burn down? <laughs> or were you disappointed that you didn't make a claim on your life insurance? <laughs> I haven't had any takers yet to questions one or two, but how many feel ripped off if they haven't fully used the money they pay in for health insurance? Culture. Great. Well, we'd like to open this up for questions from you and the audience. If you do have a question, we'd like you to identify yourself by name and affiliation, and also take advantage of some of the microphones that we have available uh, so that we can be heard. Let's take one right here in the front uh, for starters, and then we'll come to you in the middle Michael there. Michael Cook. I'm a healthcare lawyer and uh, for uh, over 30 years. I was wondering if you see the end game on this moving towards some kind of an all-payer type system where you use the same methodology at least like Maryland does for hospitals. Um, whether your Medicaid, your payer is Medicaid, uh, a private insurance or Medicare, in order, to, there are a whole host of reasons and it doesn't, it won't work exactly the way you've got Maryland working because of the vast differences. Um, and, uh, but it looks more like a public utility. Well, in fact, CMS just last week uh, made clear that it was going to open up the advanced uh, medical home uh, pilots to states to participate as well, and encouraging states to participate, states as funders. Rich, do you have a sense on that? You know, I, I think that will be one issue that gets looked at uh, as we wrestle with two factors. One is, what, what is the degree of shared responsibility? Um, and again, we will cover many more people, but we'll still have, again, some 23 or 4, estimated 23 or 4 million people uncovered. H how are those costs going to be spread? Maryland does a very good job of spreading the uncompensated care costs and sharing that responsibility. The other issue that may drive it is the issue of administrative overhead and just how much money do we want to be spending on separate systems, separate forms of paperwork, and so on? Is there a way to streamline it, but still have the element of competition across plans? Uh, that, that's another thing that could drive it. So it may be one of those options we look at as we come back to continue to uh, continue on this journey. David. Um, I don't think we'll, we'll see a single pair in the same way, but I do think we will see some collaboration across payers. I mean, in a typical market now, you have basically five insurance plans, three private ones, Medicare and Medicaid. If you go to the private plans and you say, why don't you do things like change the nature of payment, they'll say, because Medicare and Medicaid are not with me. Well, now what this law has done is given the opportunity for Medicare and Medicaid to be with them. So all of a sudden, you can sit down with, a, as Rich was saying, a relatively small number of provider groups and a relatively small number of insurers and say, what are we going to do to make this work out? And some of the more interesting conversations across the country now are of that form. How can we make this work out for all of us, focusing on whatever it is in our region that's a particular problem to us? So I would expect to see a lot more of that. I would hope to. Great. We had a question right here. Hello, my name is Ann Dubas. I work for the American Pharmacists Association, but I'm not a pharmacist. I'm questioning as a consumer, healthcare consumer. Um, what, in containing costs, uh, I'm wondering why, the impression that I get is when you go and seek medical care that the contained costs philosophy seems to be get the person out of there as fast as possible and that this does not always result in a right the first time diagnosis and progress of treatment. I'm thinking of two out of a long list of specifics that occurred to me in the United States in the present day, one of which a baby dying of meningitis last year. The mother took the child to two different emergency rooms, was blown off in both of them, as a whiny mother whose child had a cold, the baby died, and the hospitals are now being sued. All of this percolates up to your statistics. And another friend who took a bad fall from a horse, had a broken bone diagnosed, 
ended up months later having a hip replaced because the cracked hip was not diagnosed at the beginning. And I won't bore you, but I could go on and on and on. And the thing is, how does the consumer feel confidence approaching the healthcare system knowing what I as one person know? And how do you contain costs with this kind of philosophy? Bruce? Let's what philosophy? What philosophy? Don't worry about getting it thoroughly and completely diagnosed the first time. Get the person out as fast as you can. That's not the philosophy I'm talking about. I mean, I think, I'll be blunt. What we're interested in is the best possible care for every patient. Now, mistakes occur. Geisinger's not perfect. Doctors are not perfect. I could tell you a story of my internship 40 years ago at a major university hospital where I saw an elderly woman in the emergency room and she almost had a diagnosis of meningitis missed with the tests done. So I, I, I would just point out that what I'm talking about in terms of medical home and cost control is based on best possible care for the patient with the patient and the family making the decision. So the governor for this is not a rule about get everybody out in four days or two days or some thing. What it is, is it's about putting an extra resource in the primary care site so that the patient whose doctor says they're ready for discharge from the hospital goes home is not taking two of the same medicine which results in them appearing back in the emergency room three days later with drug toxicity. We ensure that if they are elderly and unable to afford medicine that they get their medicine and can take it. And as Professor Cutler noted, a, a large majority of Medicare patients who are readmitted to a hospital have not seen their doctor since they were discharged, and so we get that done. So I'm not talking about a philosophy of cost containment over the body of patients, and we need to be very clear about that. What we're talking about is what my chief calls concierge care for the elderly, which is better care that the patient wants and by getting that done, we have been able to reduce health care costs. We have not put any rules in place that say somebody can't have something. This is not a return to managed care of the late 80s and 90s. And I need to reemphasize that. This is about giving people options and helping them go where they want to go. Now, will, you know, will errors in diagnosis happen? Yes because doctors are human, patients are human, okay? So there will never be a time in, you know, in my lifetime, probably even among the youngest of you in this room, where you will not be able to find stories of something going wrong because it's, we're, we're all human. And healthcare at its heart is a matter of people taking care of people. So it's not an infallible thing. We're not, there, and computers won't change that, okay? But the point of this is that having said that, the philosophy is not cost containment. The philosophy is higher quality care for the patient driven by what they want. Most people do not want to die in a hospital with 62 tubes in and out of their body. And I've had conversations with families at that time, and you know they would have liked to have had a different option if the system had been set up differently. So I just need to make that point. Yeah, I, Rich, I, final I word. Appreciate Bruce uh, being very firm in the response. That is that is not the philosophy that any physician or hospital that I know uh, employs day in day out. What I've seen is an incredible uptake among providers and and uh, practitioners to get the data that's now available that hasn't been available in the past to find out how they're doing, to find out who's doing it better, and to figure out how to get to that level of performance as quickly as possible. So it's not about um, uh, churning or anything else. It's about getting it right for the patient's sake. 
And uh, I think that's been the single biggest and most exciting transformation I've seen in my career in the last, last five to eight years, the availability of data and the uptake and use of that data and standardized protocols that are then flow from that has just been enormous and quite proud of that. Well, just to conclude, uh, we had that informal poll taken earlier by David. It looked to me like about a third of the audience thinks uh, healthcare will become efficient in five to 10 years, another third uh, 10 and beyond years, and then of course we have David's estimate of uh, 20 years. Uh, perhaps we'll come back here 20 years from now and see who's right. And uh, we'll buy the winners a bunch of powder milk biscuits. Thanks so much to all of you for getting us off to a terrific discussion. I now have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker, who is Nancy Ann DeParle. Nancy Ann is counselor to the president and director of the White House Office of Health Reform, from which she is currently playing a lead role in health reform implementation. From 1997 to 2000, she served in the Clinton administration as administrator of the then-named Healthcare Financing Administration. Before joining HHS, she served as Associate Director for Health and Personnel at the Office of Management and Budget. In between those stints in the executive branch, she was a fellow at the Institute of Politics at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, also a senior advisor to J.B. Morgan Partners, and a commissioner of the uh, Med Medicare Payment Advisory Commission, or MedPAC. She also was a senior fellow at the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania, a trustee of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and a member of the U.S. Government Accountability Office's Controller General's Advisory Council. She also served as a director of corporate and not-for-profit boards, and we were happy very much to have her as an editorial board member of Health Affairs for a number of years. Uh, from 2006 to 2008, she was a managing director at CCMP Capital, a private equity firm. And earlier in her career, she served in the cabinet of Tennessee Governor Ned McWhorter as Commissioner of Human Services. She also has worked as a lawyer in private practice. Please join me in welcoming now Nancy Ann Mindeparl. Good morning. Thanks, Susan, for that introduction and for having me here today to have an important discussion about health reform and our next steps. Health affairs routinely leads an informed dialogue about some of the most important health care issues in our nation, and I'm honored to be able to participate today. And if I may say so, I suspect you've had a number of conferences over the last few years, including maybe even your conference in January, about whether reform will happen. And now we have, Susan, the high class problem of having conferences about how to make reform uh, implementation go well. And so I'm happy to be here to talk about that subject. I know that some people in the media um, moved on to other things uh, when the Affordable Care Act was signed into law. But the people in this room didn't. And all of you know that the hard work was just beginning. So today I want to discuss where we've been and where we're headed on health reform. We obviously didn't get here overnight. The passage of the Affordable Care Act was a historic milestone, and it was a huge part of the President's effort to strengthen our health care system. The President's been committed to reforming our health care system since his first day in office, and he had spent several years on the campaign trail traveling around the country uh, talking to people about the problems that our health care system faced. One of the first pieces of legislation the President signed was the Children's Health Insurance Program Reauthorization Act, which helped us enroll 2.6 million previously uninsured kids in CHIP and Medicaid by the end of last year. The American Recovery and Invest Reinvestment Act, the Recovery Act, made a $2 billion investment in community health centers supported important preventive health initiatives, and provided new incentives for doctors and hospitals to use health information technology. But even with these investments, we knew we needed to do more to fix our health care system and better serve the American people. Our health care system was broken, and it was unsustainable in many ways. And I think it's important, even though we have moved on to implementation and we're moving forward with that, to reflect for just a minute on what an unsustainable path we were on and what an unsustainable system the President was facing when he took office. Millions of families across the country struggled to pay premiums that were rising three times faster than their wages. 46 million people were uninsured 
health insurance premiums for families who were fortunate enough to be covered through their job at a small business had increased 85% since 2000. 16% of our economic output was tied up in the healthcare system, and we're spending roughly one in every six dollars on healthcare, despite the fact that we have 46 million people uninsured. And we knew that the stark reality was if we do nothing, in 30 years, a third of our economic output would be tied up in the healthcare system. According to the Urban Institute, under the best case scenario, without reform, the number of uninsured would be around 60 million in 2020. So we knew, and you knew, that this path wasn't sustainable. And that's why the President worked with the Congress to enact the Affordable Care Act over the past year. It certainly wasn't the most politically expedient thing to do, but it was the right thing to do. And it was a remarkable year, informed by the struggles of 1993 and 94, and I see a number of veterans of that effort in this room, and by struggles going back to President Truman's administration and even before that, where the Congress and the President had been trying to enact a comprehensive health reform law. As the President said on the day he signed the bill, after a year of striving, after a year of debate, after a historic vote, health care reform is no longer an unmet promise. It's the law of the land. So how do we move forward in implementing the new law? Well, let's talk about what it does first. First, it makes health insurance affordable for middle class and small businesses. It's one of the largest tax cuts in history for health care, reducing premiums and out-of-pocket costs. It gives millions of Americans the same type of private health insurance choices that members of Congress will have, building on the current system through a new competitive health insurance market that keeps costs down through the exchanges. It holds insurance companies accountable to keep premiums down, prevent denials of care and coverage, including for pre-existing conditions. It improves Medicare benefits with lower prescription drug costs for those in the donut hole, better chronic care, free preventive care, and more than a decade more of solvency for Medicare. The Congressional Budget Office has projected that the Affordable Care Act would save $100 billion in its first decade and another trillion dollars in the decade after that. Specifically, the law reduces the deficit by $143 billion over the next 10 years, $124 billion from the health reform provisions, and by one-fourth and one-half percent of GDP. As impressive as those figures sound, some experts think those projections may be too low. The Commonwealth Fund recently issued a report projecting larger savings, $590 billion in the first decade alone. That's a big discrepancy, but the Commonwealth experts take the analysis to its next logical step. The CBO report, of course, only looks at the federal budget implications, while Commonwealth looked at systemic impact across the nation's entire healthcare sector. Medicare, Medicaid, and other federal programs don't exist in a vacuum. They have a tremendous influence on the rest of the health care system. The Commonwealth experts recognize this and present, present their projections accordingly. The law also lowers costs for consumers. According to CBO, it will reduce premiums for comparable coverage in the individual market by anywhere from 14 to 20 percent. We're able to achieve this level of savings by bringing new people into the market, people who are healthier and younger, and by streamlining administrative costs, reducing paperwork, and increasing competition through the exchanges, the new marketplaces that will be set up. When you take into account the new tax credits, many people in the individual market could see their premiums drop by up to 60% when compared to what they would have paid without reform. The Affordable Care Act also includes many policies that experts believe will contain costs, and I think you were uh, discussing some of those when I came into the room a minute ago. One is the new CMS Center for Innovation, which for the first time will have resources dedicated to it, $10 billion, so that unlike some of the demonstration projects that have been carried out in the past or have been uh, thought of in the past, uh, the budget neutrality issue won't be something that would be an impediment to setting up a demonstration. I see people in this room who have um, uh, had frustrating uh, moments, hours, and weeks trying to work on demonstration projects like that. And this new Center for Innovation will be able to take ideas, and really move them forward, and try to diffuse them much more quickly. <laughs> Bundling payments is an idea that we want to take to the next level, and that's what this law does. Uh, 
Reducing avoidable hospital readmissions is an important way to reduce costs and also to improve quality of care for patients and their families. Creation of the new Independent Payment Advisory Board, which CBO agrees over time will have an impact on lowering costs. The excise tax on, new, on high cost health plans, uh, which will have an impact out in future years. Improving quality through many, many provisions of the new law, including uh, value-based purchasing, um, paying incentives to hospitals for measurable improvement. We know that those things will make a difference. And administrative simplifications, that the insurance companies came to the table and said, we know that we're not, we're not adding value by having so many different forms. And this administrative simplification, um, I think, will have even greater savings than CBO projects. And we know that it will save everyone a lot of headaches as well. That's why a number of prominent economists, including Nobel laureates, have noted that the law includes all the serious ideas that are out there to contain costs. And if there are more ideas, we'll be happy to look at them. As this chart net clearly shows, without reform, we would have remained on an unacceptable path. But with reform, we are bending the curve. The national health expenditures per insured person are decreasing. The passage of this legislation was historic, but that was only the first step. And I know you're interested in where do we go from here. We are working very hard to implement the law quickly, carefully, and efficiently. We know we have a big task ahead of us, but we're prepared and we're making incredible progress. The Department of Health and Human Services has begun its work to set up the transitional high risk pool program that will provide access to Americans who have been uninsured because they have a pre-existing condition. And we're working with states to get that up and running. Millions of small businesses have received information from the Department of the Treasury about how they can qualify for a new tax credit that will help them provide coverage to their employees and to maintain the coverage that they're already providing. And we recently issued new guidance clarifying that small businesses can receive both state and federal health care tax credits and made it clear that dental and vision coverage also applied to the credit. We're establishing a retiree reinsurance program that will make it easier for businesses to provide benefits to their retirees. That's a $5 billion program and those resources go directly to the bottom lines of many companies that have been struggling to continue with their retiree reinsurance programs. Claims incurred after June 1 are eligible for reimbursement. We've continued our work to crack down on fraud, waste, and abuse in Medicare, Medicaid, and CHIP. And we're going to be aggressively using the tools in the new law to fight against criminals who want to steal from American taxpayers. And the president will be talking about that some today. We've also called on insurance companies to act quickly to implement the new rules before they're required to do so by law. As you know, the law makes children up to age 26 eligible to stay on their parents' health care plans beginning in September. We called on insurance companies to implement this provision now, and 65 of the largest insurance companies agreed to do so, and many employers are following suit. We also heard, as many of you did, some startling reports that some insurance companies were targeting women with breast cancer and rescinding their policies. The new law makes that practice of rescissions illegal, and we urged insurance companies to drop the practice immediately, and they've done just that. Over the course of the coming weeks, our team across the government, at HHS, at the Department of Labor, at Treasury, at OPM, uh, and at the White House, will continue to work diligently to produce new regulations and guidance that will help us implement this landmark new law. We know that there are many questions that need to be answered through the regulatory process, and we're working to reach out to groups and to uh, sit down with them and hear their thoughts and ideas. Uh, we have made reaching out to stakeholders one of uh, our top priorities. We've held countless meetings with individuals and organizations to hear their thoughts and views on key issues, and that will continue, and our doors are open, and uh, we're all ears to hear what you have to say. Many of you and the organizations you represent have tremendous knowledge and expertise, so we do want to hear from you and urge you to give us a call. We know that this won't be easy, but we also know that the stakes are too high to fail. There are too many Americans who are counting on us to ensure that they get the high quality care that they need and deserve. The President, the day the bill passed, um, 
said to me that he knows it isn't enough to just have a good law. It has to be implemented in the right way. It has to be implemented efficiently and effectively and carefully. We're well on our way to achieving that goal and to realizing the promise of health reform. I want to thank you for the time you're spending working on implementation and for your time today. And best wishes for another great discussion at Health Affairs. And I'm looking forward to reading the June issue as I fall asleep in bed after the end of one of these days. Thank you so much. Nancy Ann, thank you so much. Nancy Ann is, of course, on her way to the town hall to talk with Medicare beneficiaries about some of the aspects of the law uh, that uh, will benefit them. We're going to take a 15-minute coffee break now. Uh, coffee, et cetera, in the back room. We'll see you back here in 15 minutes, and we'll move forward with our next panel on insurance market reforms. Thanks so much, et cetera. It's a broad topic, and of course, Many of you will recall that for at least uh, a few weeks, the entire bill was being referred to as a health insurance reform, uh, as, as distinct from all the other aspects of the legislation uh, designed to influence the delivery system. We're very delighted to have with us several authors as well as uh, commentators who can uh, or are going to use the, some of the observations made by the authors and their own work uh, to make some additional analyses. First, we're very happy to have with us Scott Kiefer, who is Vice President of Legislative Affairs and Policy Development for America's Health Insurance Plans. His mission is to help policymakers and AHIP members develop innovative market-based proposals to improve and expand access to health insurance coverage. Before joining AHIP, he was Legislative Director for Congressman Harold Ford and also had worked on Capitol Hill in, in the 90s as a legislative assistant to former Congressman Harold Ford Sr., where he was responsible for issues considered by the House Ways and Means Committee. He's also worked in the office of former U.S. District Judge Robert Sindrich, at the, uh, at the, also at the Environmental Protection Agency, and at a law firm where he helped represent clients on health and environmental claims. We're also very happy to have with us John Kingsdale, who, with John Burko, authored a paper on exchanges in our June issue and the choices that states will have to make. John uh, is the former executive director of the Commonwealth Health Insurance Connector Authority, an independent authority established under Massachusetts landmark health reform legislation of 2006. He worked in that capacity in a, with a broadly representative board of directors to help develop key elements of healthcare financing policy in Massachusetts, as well as to develop and implement the new program uh, and build a capable organization supporting the health insurance exchanges in Massachusetts. Previous to that position, he was a senior executive at the Tufts Health Plans for almost 20 years, and his work prior to that includes executive roles in strategic planning and reimbursement at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts, as well as research on hospital finances at the Harvard School of Public Health. And um, we're very proud to claim John as one of our own in journalism since he started life as a reporter for Forbes magazine, or at least not started life, but started. <laughs> Prodigy, though, that you, that you were, John. Uh, started your career in that capacity. Great. Then we're happy to have with us Len Nichols, who's director of the College of Health and Human Services Cent Center for Health Policy Research and Ethics at George Mason University. Many of you will know that Len was formerly director of the health policy program at the New America Foundation. And before that, he was a vice president at the Center for Studying Health System Change. During the first two years of the Clinton administration, Len was the senior advisor for health policy at the Office of Management and Budget. He also served on Medicare's Competitive Pricing Advisory Commission, and he was a member of the 2001 Technical Review Panel for the Medicare Trustees Reports. He's been an advisor to the World Bank, the Pan American Health Organization, and was a member of Louisiana Governor Kathleen Blanco's Health Reform task force in 2004 and 2000, to 2006. 
And finally, we'll, we'll have a presentation from Deborah Chalet, who authored a paper in our issue about the temporary high-risk program. Deborah is a senior fellow at Mathematica Policy Research in Washington and a national expert on state health insurance markets and public-private sector health care reforms. She's led numerous studies on individual and small group health insurance markets, as well as on the impact of state regulation and policy actions on insurance markets and coverage. She's a senior consultant to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation State Coverage Initiatives Program and a frequent consultant to state officials on health insurance market dynamics and policy options for expanding private health insurance coverage. So first we'll turn to Scott Kiefer for the view from the insurance sector. Scott, welcome. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Susan. It's a pleasure uh, to be with you all today. I appreciate the opportunity uh, and uh, especially the, the great contribution uh, that my, my fellow panelists uh, have made to the, to the June volume, which is really important and you should be commended for. Uh, what I want to do today, uh, if you could hand me the clicker, uh, is I want to start by uh, sort of stating the obvious. Uh, and that is uh, we have, I think, the appropriate foundation uh, in place to have a transformative system, uh, both with respect to uh, access uh, and also delivery. Uh, but uh, maybe an analogy appropriate for the day, I think it's fair to say we have the right stuff. Uh, we're somewhere probably in the range of the second, uh, maybe the bottom of the third. Uh, it looks like we're going to get there, uh, but it's a long way to the ninth, uh, till, the, till the final out. Uh, so as much as there's hope over at uh, Nationals Park, I think there's <laughs> hope and optimism uh, with respect to uh, all of us here. Uh, that's the good news. Uh, the bad news is uh, the work uh, really uh, is just beginning. Uh, and I think in the interest of time, I don't want to cover uh, each of the discrete provisions uh, that, uh, that uh, Nancy Ann DeParle spoke to, uh, but just to say a few words in sort of the way that uh, the industry thinks about uh, bucketing them. Uh, as uh, Nancy Ann mentioned, I think with respect to dependent coverage, uh, the rescissions issue, uh, our membership uh, and uh, our board of directors have looked for opportunities uh, to engage early uh, and do the right thing, uh, particularly, for example, with respect to dependent coverage. It just makes eminent sense, uh, not just from a policy standpoint, uh, to prevent people from being uh, disenrolled uh, in what we say aging off, uh, but to keep them enrolled from an administrative standpoint as well. Uh, again, it makes both business and policy sense, so I, th I would just highlight that as one example. There are a number of changes uh, that are going to go into effect in short order that are really going to fundamentally change the market, uh, the biggest of which is perhaps uh, the minimum loss ratio. Uh, and again, uh, not to say too much on this, except there are a few key issues that are still being hashed out uh, in a technical aspect. I know from Len's paper, uh, he thinks many of the challenges uh, are political going forward. Uh, I, I would suggest that sometimes the technical and the political tend to overlap. Uh, and I think we've seen that uh, with respect to uh, the MLR. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, discussion uh, uh, in addition uh, to dependent coverage on the high risk pool. Uh, I know uh, Deborah is going to talk at length about that. Uh, I want to say that uh, I agree with her uh, that we know that uh, the funding is going to be uh, stretched uh, to say the least. Uh, the criteria for this federal program starting is a, a 180 to say the least uh, from existing high risk pools. Uh, so we know that for the first time, the federal government has a sizable and substantial commitment to high risk pools, uh, but because premiums will be offered at a standard rate uh, and, uh, and a number of other factors, including uh, some on the bottom uh, with respect to uh, prohibition on lifetime limits, uh, many of the pools now have lifetime limits. We know that that money uh, could uh, go very, very quickly. Um, on the benefit side, uh, just to comment briefly, uh, one thing that we're really, really concerned about from the industry standpoint, uh, when these uh, discrete items are viewed in isolation, uh, preventive benefits, which there are important policy reasons uh, for, uh, the industry supports, limitations on lifetime and annual limits, each of those, uh, as many uh, 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 analysts have suggested, uh, in and of themselves may have a nominal impact. But when you put them together, uh, two or three or four things, uh, 
uh, with a one or two percent impact uh, have the potential to be significant uh, in terms of premium, which I think is a challenge. Uh, and secondly, uh, there's the issue of provider capacity, uh, something that I know uh, in Massachusetts, uh, particularly in many urban uh, and rural areas, uh, they had challenges with uh, primary care, for example. When we talk uh, about the broader reforms, uh, I've tried to, again, uh, separate these out uh, into uh, discrete areas uh, where, where uh, to, to sort of give them a tagline that I think will define what that, area, what that era represents. Uh, 2011 to 2012 clearly will be the period of federalism, uh, when the states ramp up, uh, when they uh, uh, build the exchange or exchanges, uh, as John uh, will, will go through in more detail. I think uh, we have, uh, from a federal standpoint, also the initial delivery changes, uh, which uh, just like those who are going to go to Nationals Park later today, uh, and as David Cutler and colleagues spoke to, we're very optimistic about. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we're concerned uh, uh, with respect to, number one, the capacity uh, at CMS and the agencies, and number two, uh, the political will, uh, something that I'll talk more about with respect to Congress. Uh, there's also, of course, the issue of uh, perennially the SGR. Uh, the FMAP, uh, whether FMAP is extended uh, again or not, uh, we know that there won't be an extension next year. Uh, so just as states are thinking about building the exchanges, uh, we're going to have uh, uh, this, this uh, Medicaid uh, challenge uh, again. With respect to uh, the enrollment, uh, uh, when the exchanges are up uh, and moving forward, I think uh, one concern uh, that is broad uh, throughout the industry uh, is whether we've learned the lessons uh, of Medicaid and CHIP. Uh, and this clearly is an example, I guess, to uh, continue with the baseball analogy uh, of if we build it, uh, they will come. Uh, we know that we've had uh, challenges, uh, to say the least, enrolling people uh, for whom coverage is largely free. Uh, we think that uh, there are a number of issues that require a delicate balance uh, with respect to uh, b building the system. Uh, grandfathering uh, is an example. But the bottom line is, uh, in terms of what I call the all-important first year, we've got a really, really serious challenge ahead of us ensuring that we have a balanced pool. Uh, what the country doesn't have the benefit of from the standpoint of reform is what Massachusetts did, and that is of already having a guarantee issue environment. And I say the benefit of because we know one thing in a guarantee issue state that those who are going to come into the system invariably are likely to improve the quality of the pool, the balance of the pool. Uh, we're likely to get healthy people in, and that's likely to have a positive impact on premiums. We don't know that to be the case in the vast majority of states now that are underwritten. It just makes intuitive behavioral sense. I don't need to be an economist or an actuary, which I'm not. I'm a lawyer, like everyone, well, like most other people in Washington. <laughs> But the point is, the point is that uh, we're very concerned that, of course, you're going to have adverse risks come in, and if that's your foundation, uh, the exchanges could be in really serious trouble. So it's going to take a lot of us rolling up our sleeves, making sure that we're uh, getting a balanced pool enrolled and uh, getting those young invincibles in. When we go beyond uh, the 2014 period, uh, I think uh, there are a number of markers uh, that are important to watch. Uh, I think, uh, number one, uh, we'll begin measuring uh, the access, uh, the delivery reforms. Also, we'll begin to think about the next phase of delivery reforms. So what is the Secretary going to decide in 2015 with respect to hospital readmissions? Are we going to have the strength and the fortitude to go beyond the initial three conditions? Uh, there's also, uh, as, as David spoke to, issues related to bundling, value-based purchasing. And then from the access standpoint, the big marker for the industry is going to be what happens in 2017. Uh, as most of you know, in 2017, the states are given the complete authority to determine wide discretion as to what group size is appropriate for the exchange. This could be a good thing. It could be a bad thing. Uh, we could see a situation where if larger and larger groups have the opportunity to come into the exchange, we could see adverse risks come in. 
Likewise, on the smaller side, we could see smaller and smaller groups pulling themselves out of the exchange, self-funding, because, for example, obviously if a firm is only paying claims expenditures, then the health status of that firm is ultimately going into what their premium is. Uh, so there are a number of uh, potential unintended consequences that we have to be very careful to avoid. Um, I think those of us in the industry that are concerned about potential adverse selection in the exchanges were very happy to see that there was a little no notice provision put in that requires the Labor Department and the regulatory authorities to do an annual assessment of what's happening in the exchanges, and that will be critically important to determine what we do in 2017 and beyond. Uh, because in addition to this group dynamic, there are also issues like the new uh, national insurance provider fee or premium tax, which only apply to fully insured business, which could also serve as a powerful incentive for groups uh, to self-fund. So in conclusion, uh, as I indicated, uh, the ultimate goal here is to have a balanced pool and a sustainable system. What we want to do is we want to pay close attention uh, to what's happening with respect to employer coverage. As I indicated, this is really critical in 2017 and beyond, but the first years we have to clearly understand that experience. We also know, as John will speak to, that the states have a lot of flexibility, uh, which could be good, uh, but if we have too much variation uh, with respect to the exchanges, it could be challenging uh, in moving to a, a national uh, marketplace. The market reforms, again, uh, to reemphasize the importance of the all-important first year, and then to drive home the sustainability point, there's this issue that really, really concerns me as someone who spent uh, a decade on Capitol Hill as to what the role of Congress is uh, going forward in the delivery reforms. Because again, I do believe we have the appropriate foundation, but the question is whether Congress is gonna be giving a boost to that foundation or whether they're going to be uh, uh, a challenge. Uh, so I'm, I'm not optimistic. Uh, Again, uh, I think one thing uh, that I'd be interested in John's comments on uh, with respect to the sustainability point is we feel that we have to learn what uh, I think is a clear lesson from Massachusetts and the headlines that we've seen uh, with respect to premium increases over the last uh, 90 days or so uh, since there's been a challenge, and that is that it's critically important to put access and delivery on parallel tracks. Uh, otherwise, we're just kicking the can down the road. We're going to have a real challenge uh, with that sustainability uh, point, uh, and that could lead to, uh, I guess, again, uh, since it is a new day for baseball fans in Washington, uh, an infinite number of brushbacks uh, to the insurance industry uh, and to AHIP members. Uh, but in all seriousness, uh, I think the bottom line is that we have a great opportunity, uh, but we can't uh, sort of sit back and rest on our laurels, uh, that we've really got to get to work and make sure that the system works uh, and fulfills uh, the, the promise that the uh, proponents of it have suggested. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Thank you for this opportunity, and I'm not a lawyer. Um, <clears throat> in fact, those, of you, those folks who have seen me try to imitate one, um, can attest to that. Uh, thank you for this opportunity and, and for doing this issue, Susan. This was uh, a great uh, addition to the sort of public discourse uh, in Washington and among uh, policy wonks. And um, I know my my grandparents and my kids read Health Affairs too, so that's they, they enjoyed it. <coughs> um, uh, I, I'm going to begin with a question and end with a question, for which I apologize. This is. Um, I decided to do a little risk management and say less than more, uh, since I wasn't sure what would be useful. Um, <clears throat> but uh, Scott's done a great job of enumerating some of the concerns. And I just, um, one more parenthetic note before I get going. Um, you know, I just want to thank, uh, acknowledge, uh, sort of, you know, if you, if you listen to all those concerns that Scott talked about, 
and you know, I'm sure there's a variety of opinions here about the insurance industry um, and uh, their, their role in society. But <clears throat> it's pretty clear that um, PPACA is a fundamental uh, change in the landscape and the business of insurance. I mean, it's just going to fundamentally change it. And I can tell you from personal experience, two of the health plans that I used to work at in Massachusetts um, one at least is still trying to, um, you know, fight it. I mean, trying to deny it, not actively fight it, but sort of deny that the landscape has uh, re been revolutionized instead of saying, oh my goodness, we have an eight year leap on the rest of the country. What a great opportunity. Um, and that's not to say anything about that health plan, it's to say how is to give you some sense of how fundamentally uh, government has stepped in and shifted. Um, the sands beneath their feet. And, and you all are in some sort of business, uh, one way or another, whether you're lobbyists or policy wonks or staff to legislators or reporters. And, you know, think about if, uh, I, I'm not sure there's ever been anything in your business that even comes close to this degree of fundamental change. So um, I, want, for one, want to sort of uh, thank the health plans that have stepped to the line to um, those 65 that the SEN to Parle mentioned um, to do some good stuff early. Because uh, I, I tell you, I spent four years in Massachusetts just thanking people. Um, that's really most of what I did. And if we don't start thanking the people who are going to be fundamentally demanded to change the way they behave, whether hospitals or doctors or uh, consumer advocacy groups or uh, insurers or brokers, um, I think we're not going to you know, come together around this stuff. So <clears throat> those are all my, um, maybe I've used up my time, can I? Oh, okay. Um, so let me say a few things about exchanges since that's kind of where I've been pigeonholed. Um, and one is um, to raise the question, what is an exchange? You know, uh, there are definitions, there are, there are concepts of exchanges in the minds of people who voted for this legislation, let alone everybody uh, in this room and in the country, that are radically different. Um, anywhere from sort of a HIPIC, uh, a man, you know, the, the epitome of managed competition, a place to organize um, uh, outright competition among selected health plans, to at the other end, kind of what I call an automated yellow pages, um, a digital yellow pages. Uh, here's the list of all the insurers, go forth and good luck. Um, and there are folks who would, you know, like that to be what an exchange is. Um, and there are others who see it as a nifty little market term for actually premium rate regulation. Um, <laughs> it's really what they want to do. So those are just three examples. Um, and of course, one of the political assets of this word um, is that it, the concept is so mutable that it's uh, been somewhat pleasing uh, to most people who can sit around a table, have very different concepts of it in mind, and all vote yes. Now, that can turn to no very quickly, and that may be what's coming. It, it's interesting as a parenthetical note that in Massachusetts, um, where, uh, well, in Massachusetts, the legislature actually re rejected uh, Governor Romney's term of an exchange, or maybe it was the Heritage Fund's term, Foundation's term, and call it a connector. And it's interesting that uh, they didn't even like the market orientation of that word. So I'm going to talk a little bit about six uh, key design issues briefly and uh, to illustrate how mutable this concept is, how flexible it is, and then uh, call your attention to a question at the end um, that I think that's, that, that points to. So, uh, you know, one issue is governance. Um, should it be an independent authority? Should it be in the secretary of HHS office? Should it be in the governor's office? Should it be in the division of insurance? Should it be contracted out to a nonprofit private entity? Those are all pretty obvious choices and options and with very different implications. And then even if you want to put it as an independent authority with its board, as we have in Massachusetts, who ought to sit on that board? Um, you know, we, our legislation prohibited insurers and brokers from being on it. Well, every year there's an amendment to put a broker on it. Um, and clearly we're, you know, in the distribution business. Um, and brokers are experts in distribution. So, um, some very interesting uh, questions about where this thing sits and how it's governed. Um, a second key design issue is going to be the rating rules of the, of the of the road. You know, exchanges are in most people's minds uh, designed to enhance and focus competition among health plans on what I call uh, policy desirable factors. 
things like administrative costs, care management, efficacy, um, uh, service, uh, price, you know, premium, uh, and not on risk selection. And we spent a lot of our time, frankly, worrying about how to get that competition focused on everything but sort of the easiest, most obvious way to save money, which is risk selection. Um, so those rating rules are absolutely critical. For example, um, in order to prevent selection against the exchange, do you require the same products that are in the exchange to be offered outside the exchange? And do you require only those products be offered outside the exchange? Just one of many questions. Um, risk adjustment itself is the sort of the fallback. If the rules don't do it and you want to do some truing up between health plans or between the exchange, plans in the exchange and plans outside so that, again, the game is not just about finding the healthiest people and therefore charging them a nickel less and making a lot more money. Um, formal risk adjustment using claims history is a key way to do it. But it's not at all, there's a whole bunch of technical issues, but fundamentally what it means is moving money from health plan A to health plan B. And we're talking about moving, what, a billion dollars? I'm sorry, a trillion dollars? I get these things mixed up. Uh, a trillion dollars um, <clears throat> a year. You know, private health insurance, a trillion dollars a year. So uh, this is not going to be uh, kind of politically and controversial. Medicare seems to have done it with Medicare Advantage, but um, I think this is going to be very, very uh, heavily lobbied and watched and controversial. Uh, benefit options. What do you offer? This, an exchange is, if it is nothing else, it's an insurance store. So what are you selling? Are you selling um, you know, the precious metals, gold, platinum, silver, and bronze? You, the health plans define the benefits and the cost sharing. Are you selling standardized benefits and cost sharing so that every gold plan looks exactly the same? Um, are you selling PPOs or HMOs or high deductible health plans? Um, what exactly are you selling and what are you allowing to be sold outside? These are some pretty uh, critical issues. Um, then there's the whole game theory. Fifth issue is bid and selection. So how does, if the exchange is sort of like an employer creating options for its employees, how do you get good, a limited number of choices uh, so that people can decide because too much choice is overwhelming. On what basis do you select? There's some guidance in ACA as to you know rank ordering plans and so forth. But um, some folks want to negotiate. Well, what do you negotiate over when premiums can change every month? Um, so you do a bid and you select somebody who's the lowest premium, the 10 lowest premiums for, for a value of benefits for January 2014 and what happens in February 14. Um, do you do bidding? What do you bid on? Uh, and, or do you have just sort of open competition? Um, and then there's the whole administrative set of issues, administrative issues about, you know, is the exchange really health reform central? Is it going to be the place everybody in Iowa goes to find out what health reform for Iowans mean? Or is it going to be uh, lean, mean, Utah-like, you know, two people in the governor's office and the biggest bragging point is it costs virtually nothing to run this thing. Um, are there going to be, you know, this is a very scale sensitive enterprise. To do it for 200,000 people or a million people costs only a fraction more than to do it for 50,000 people. So are you just going to drive towards volume and, and use that to reduce administrative costs? Um, and is it going to be, you know, a consumer advocacy site with all sorts of tools? So the reason I mention those is not that I have any light to shed on them. Uh, and I know that that's what you would like. Um, but it is to uh, underscore the following question. Just as exchanges are fairly uh, flexible or mutable, um, and if you've seen one, you've seen one, there's something that I think I detect from the hinterland, from way up in Boston, that's not going on here. And that's not going on in some of the state capitals where I've begun to have conversations with policymakers. And that is to step way back. And this is what any corporation would do. So I'm, I'm, I'm sort of betraying my naive private sector uh, 30 years of experience. We step way back when there is a fundamental ground shift in your business conditions and say, OK, what's our goal here? What are we trying to do? What's the overall strategy? And that's different from diving into the act and saying, you know what, there are 10,000 unclear things, and what are we going to do about each one of those? Um, are we fundamentally talking about managed competition? Is that where the exchange 
uh, is going? Is that where insurance market reform is going? You know, my friends at Kaiser would love that the answer to be yes. That's certainly what they would want. Uh, we tried that in some respects in Massachusetts for small employers. And by the way, the small employer and the non-group exchanges are completely different. But uh, we tried it for small employers and got a lot of interesting pushback operationally, market pushback. Turns out, you know, Joe's gas station could care less about Alan Antoven's theory of managed competition. If I could save a nickel, that's where I'm going. Um, is it to create competition? You know, Olympia Snow's, uh, one of her primary concerns uh, throughout the healthcare debate in the last year was, how do I get more than two health plans into Maine? You know, we don't exactly have competition here. So what's the role of an exchange if you're a state that has a Blue Cross plan with 70% share and another plan um, with 28% uh, share? Where's the store function? Um, is it to just slash distribution costs? There are parts of the country where it costs 10, 10 20, 30% just to distribute insurance, just to sort of get it into the hands of people uh, in the small group and non-group market. Huge opportunities to do that. Uh, is it really to regulate premiums? Um, that's surely where the, where the journalists are gonna go in month three and month six and month nine and year two and year three and year 10 and year 20 and year 30. So what have you done to slash premiums? Um, uh, or is it, as 20 states have indicated, really just to um, fight the Civil War all over again? Uh, <laughs> so with that, I, under I turn it over. I'm, I'm thankful also that, um, as great as it was to go after Scott, that I, you put me before Len, uh, because he's going to crack you all up. And maybe he'll shed some light on my strategic question as well. Anyway, thank you very much. Well, I feel a little nervous getting the microphone after you ended on the Civil War with the way I talk, but I, I will try to plow ahead here. Um, I do would I would say I do understand it better than you do, no doubt. Okay, um, losing will do that to you. But anyway, that's my task. I want to first thank Susan for thinking of this issue and giving us all an entire week to write the paper. That was a <laughs> Very nice honor. But I was also really impressed with their staff for making it all happen on time. We had 48 hours to do uh, galleys. And uh, I think for most of us, being in one place for 48 hours is pretty unusual. So it was quite a feat. So thank you. Um, well, that's interesting. I'm going to talk about John. Um, <laughs> the first thing I want to say is to react to this, I would just say, rhetoric. And it is related to the Civil War comment that somehow this bill became, in my view, kind of a metaphor for our view of government. And people who don't like government got excited about it in the negative, and people who do like government got excited about it in the positive. And this should never have been about our theory of government, per se. So I just want to make it clear that this bill is not a representation of putting the jackboot of federal tyranny on the neck of sons and daughters of liberty. <laughs> It is really about, look, a federal takeover bill is not 2,000 pages. A federal takeover bill is two lines. You're all in Medicare. It starts in July. <laughs> you know, with a little parentheses for Mitch McConnell, get over it. But I mean, a 2,000-page bill is about trying to fit a bunch of ideas onto our rather, let's be clear, Byzantine system which we have built, which we can't afford, which is the one thing I think David and, and uh, Michael agree upon here. We can't afford what we got. Okay, so what it's really in, in the fundamental sense about is an extension of federalism, which we have always done. Let us not forget We've been messing with insurance markets for quite some time because they just don't work like we like them to. And we started with McCarran-Ferguson, 1945, a few other things were going on. So we decided to leave, this, leave it to the states after the Supreme Court had said shock and, and, and awe. Indeed, uh, insurance was interstate commerce and therefore subject to federal regulation. But the feds didn't want it because they were busy fighting a war and the states were I guess you'd say ready. The industry certainly wanted state regulation. And in fact, you can argue, and I would, that was the right call in 1945. Because you might have heard this rumor, America's a big old diverse country. Utah is quite different from Massachusetts. 
in virtually every way you could imagine. <laughs> and there are nice people in both places. So what I would say is that it's an extension of federalism as we have always had it. McCarran and Ferguson was the first example where the key thing here is federal purpose but the states will be charged with doing the regulation as long as they do so pursuant to federal purpose. And we've done that through HMO and ERISA and everything else. And so HIPAA was another example of that federalism. Federal purpose, we will stop not having guaranteed issue for small groups. We will basically codify what was already present in roughly 35, 40 states. But there will be a federal floor. Again, states enforce it. 47 did originally, 49 do today. Feds will do it if you won't, but you don't have to. You can make this, and this is my fundamental point. Successful health reform is a participation sport. And this bill allows that participation to occur. So the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act is really an extension of all that. Now, um, I did notice when I sent my slides that the cyber gnomes got involved in the order change. And I, I have no doubt that there are people somewhere who think this order makes more sense. So I'll just go with it, but it's not exactly what I remember preparing it to in the morning uh, last night. But anyway, um, the first element of the federalism I want to convey is grants to states to set up ombudsman's program, not come to HHS for all the answers but money to states to do the interface where indeed people live and get their insurance. Now, I would lump the second bullet, reporting and regulation of medical loss ratios with the fifth annual review of premium increases. What that is really about is asserting, as John stated quite well, more federal authority over the actions of insurers. In a sense, to assess, if you will, the reasonableness and I would put that word in quotations and italics and flashing red, what the hell ever that means, but reasonableness of the premiums. And then, of course, what is in this loss ratio? And I would certainly hasten to pick up on Scott's rather uh, subtle statement that some of the letters I read on the loss ratio business make me think, you think the Civil War was a fight? I mean, you know, this, this, this divergence of opinion is extreme. I'll just say, the last thing you want to do here is turn insurers into claims processors only. That would be a pretty big mistake. Because we're going to need all the arrows in our quiver, and part of the arrows that we need live inside insurance companies. And we're going to have to figure out how to make their expertise dovetail. In fact, what I would say this really is about but I'll get to that in a moment. Okay, high risk pools. Deborah's gonna talk about that in, at some length, but I'll just say the fundamental reason that's a federalism issue is because 30 something states already have one. As far as I know, tell me if I'm wrong, none of them have the same conditions that are in the federal law. So there's gotta be coordination just to make it dovetail for the particular individual. And I must say, almost every cab I get in now has a guy who's thinking about this high risk pool. It's really interesting, All, especially outside of Washington. It's just amazing how many people are in the situation where they've got a pre-existing condition, they're older typically, they can't get it, whatever, you know, and, and they're trying to figure out how does this work. So I now have 37 examples mailed to Karen Pollitz every day to tell her what she's going to think about. So high-risk pools have to be coordinated. Setting up the exchange, John talked about that in, in, you know, as only John can. What's striking to me in the law is the set of choices the states are given. First, do it yourself or set up a nonprofit. Second, do you really want to meld or not this small group individual market? These are all state choices. Do you want to have a sub-state set of exchanges in your state? Do you want to have a multi-state? This is all about giving states choice because remember now, class, Utah's different than Massachusetts. And they think different and they act different and their insurance markets work quite differently. Finally, let me get to state insurance departments and regulation. Both of the immediate stuff, and Scott listed those so I won't, but I'll, I'll just say, I don't know how you do this from the federal government alone. You know, when I wrote the paper, because we had to write the paper pretty soon after the bill got signed, um, at that moment, Sibelius had not named Jay Angoff and Steve Larson. Sibelius was the only human being in the whole department who'd ever seen what insurers submit. 
And that's the good news because that means in every meeting she attends, her expertise from state regulation is in the room. But I notice, having been a federal employee there a couple of decades ago, she can't be in every room every day. So it's really hard to have this. So there's no way you're going to do this without a lot of state, I would say, education. And what was heartening to me was to remember some scholarship health affairs published where in the implementation of HIPAA, essentially the insurance department of Missouri taught HHS how to do this because the legislature of Missouri didn't want to participate which gets to my next point, which we'll get to in a minute. Okay, so here's what I would say, you know, what do I know? I'm a policy wonk. What do I know about implementation? So I notice everybody's got triangles today, though. That seems to be the way to go. Um, <laughs> this is my view of a three-pillar implementation that works. The lower right-hand corner, of course, is the base of authority. You got to have the authority to do what you got to do. But there's also the question of capacity. My simple point is a great deal, in fact, most of the capacity do actually understand what insurers are doing and trying to do to make this bill work. That capacity lives in the states. And we would be foolish to deny that. In fact, we'd be smart to integrate and engage and so forth. But then finally, and maybe even most importantly, to make this work, remember, participation sport, is the self-interest of the very players that um, did have a fair number of, uh, shall we say, arguments about the specifics of this bill. And I'll just say it in a couple of different ways. Right now, Scott and his colleagues are in a position where fundamentally they can say the sky is blue and half the people in Congress won't believe them. Even though, my observation, the sky's blue an awful lot. We have to be careful about discounting the truth about what the costs of running an insurance operation are. We have to be careful about thinking about what the functions are that we need done in terms of assessing quality of care and credentials of, of uh, providers and so forth. We have to be careful about where to put these um, authorities going forward. And remember, you know, I think John said it, what this is really about fundamentally is changing the business model of insurance from risk selection to a world in which they will thrive and they can thrive in this new world if, but only if, they learn to teach all their enrollees how to find value in the healthcare system. Moving from risk selection to enabling us to find value. That dovetails perfectly, by the way, with the other business model we've got to change, which is moving from pay for, va pay for volume, as David Cutler talked about, to pay for value for providers. So if you've got insurers incentivized to help us find value, you've got providers incentivized to deliver value, that's what economists call alignment of interest. That's what makes us happy. That's what makes it possible for us to believe we can indeed bend this cost curve and make this thing sustainable for the insured. Forget the uninsured. Just sustainable for the insured. And in doing so, by the way, we'll make it possible to make this thing affordable. Okay, so what are the major challenges? I would submit the thing I worry the most about is actually the fact that the states are, you might have heard this rumor, broke. And the, they're, going through the, they're going through the worst economic times for state governments since the Great Depression, because this is the worst economy since the Great Depression. And they, unlike the federal government, can't just borrow. So they are, at this moment, cutting back in the very core analytic and planning capacity that they need most preciously to be investing in these directions. And one of the places this scares me the most is the question of how you're going to monitor who's eligible for and therefore who's responsible for people who may be eligible for Medicaid today but private insurance and in exchange subsidies tomorrow and vice versa. First thing I learned back in the Clinton era was how dynamic the low-income population is. We tend to think about numbers in a box. You know, we get them here and they're all covered by this and that. But people move. People change a lot. So there's going to be a lot of flexibility in who, what you're eligible for. Think about it. States have a powerful incentive to make sure everybody's eligible for the exchange to get 100% federal money. And the federal government will have the opposite incentive. So we've got to have a system of information that works. We've got to therefore, but more importantly, say maybe for the insurance reform piece is who's in charge? of, if you will, managing the, in the, the plan individual interaction 
Is it the Medicaid program? Is it the exchange? Is it the Department of Insurance? We need to have a very, very good information system, a very, very good planning for that implementation of that, that information system. And I worry that we are being penny wise and pound foolish right now. But the biggest challenge by far is the Civil War. It is the reality that we have, um, I mean, you mean, if you think, you know, uh, uh, Fox News and MSNBC are pretty far apart, um, come with me to North Dakota. I mean, it's real. And, and there are people who really do honestly, sincerely believe this is, this is, this is the jackboot of federal tyranny on the ne neck of uh, sons and daughters of liberty. And they're Americans, too. So we have to figure out how to talk to them, how to listen to them, how to, you know, all bad behaviors based on fear. They're mostly scared. But I don't have time to calm them all down. So what you got to do here is think about what this means in my view. The tragedy is the politics of this is preventing the very state engagement and implementation that can make this a true participation sport. Now some may indeed want to engender that outcome because they want to be able to point in an election future, see, I told you it was a federal takeover. That is not, in my view, a fair read of this bill. That is certainly not the intention of the senators who wrote the bulk of this part of it. And I don't believe it's a fair appreciation for what the spirit of this legislation is all about. However, it is likely to be the short run reality in 20 states. So we have to figure out how to forgive our brothers and sisters and pick it back up when we don't get it done like we want to quickly. I'm very worried about the high risk pool, but I'm more worried about the exchange. And I think we do have time to fix it, but it's gonna take a lot of effort to make this more of a participation sport and less of a federal takeover. Thank you very much. Good morning. Is this on? Yeah. So my job as cleanup is to talk about that much touted high risk pool. <laughs> Um, I'm going to spend most of my time this morning talking about why the high-risk pool as opposed to what the high-risk pool will be. If there's anything hazardous about uh, forecasting the future, is forecasting the near future so that everybody has time to remember how wrong you were. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to talk about why um, focus on the um, uh, high-risk individuals, why this is one of the first steps forward for the privately insured population or the population that would be privately insured, um, why not something else? I'm one of those people who believes that health insurers probably could march forward, most of them could march forward to 2014 on a faster pace, but the uh, federal high-risk program is uh, premised on Insurer is not marching forward before 2014 into the brave new world of guaranteed issue, of um, limited rating, and no rating on health status. Um, and the federal high risk program and the state high risk pools are all built around the fact that most insurers, in fact, do medically underwrite. Um, they do um, put uh, uh, gauge rates on, on health status. So bear in mind the world that Scott outlined. Um, that we're moving toward a, a world of guaranteed issue, toward no health rating, toward a world that I think really has to exist for the private health insurance market to work. That is, you have to be able to buy health insurance on the same basis you buy an airline ticket. Len can go on at 2.30 when he's done his, um, putting together his presentation, 2.30 in the morning, and buy a ticket anywhere because that's all you need to do is state where you want to go, who you are, and um, demonstrate some ability to pay. Um, that's what has to happen for the 20-somethings, the 30-somethings um, to buy health insurance successfully. We've been um, you know, worrying for years about why young adults don't buy health insurance, and one reason is that it's so hard to do it. You can't go on in the middle of the night um, and, get a, a, and get an offer and get a price, and that's what we're moving forward to. So the federal high-risk pool is, um, as others have noted, unusual. It is not like the state high-risk pools. Um, it tries to move toward that um, world in which you call up and you get an offer and you get a price. So let me backtrack and talk about um, the current world. Why focus on high-risk individuals? Um, we need to move forward on slides. Here, 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 you do. Oh, I do it. Yeah. Okay, gee, yes. I thought it's somebody else was in control yeah. here. Am I moving? I'm moving the wrong direction. There you go. There we go. Why focus on high-risk individuals? Um, 
HIPAA did a lot for um, uh, the workers and their dependents and groups. It did relatively little for anybody who's in the individual market. Um, and that means that if I am just wandering into the individual market and I haven't been careful to guard my HIPAA protections, I face a very hostile uh, kind of market. Um, I can be denied coverage, just simply turned down. Um, I can be told um, that you can get coverage, but whatever is wrong with you will never be covered. <laughs> um, and, I, and that can be uh, very broadly construed um, to eliminate, for example, your brain, uh, your circulatory system. <laughs> okay, I mean, it's, this is, these are very, very broad exclusions of coverage, typically. Um, or I can be offered coverage, I might be offered some limited exclusions on coverage, and I will be offered a very high premium based on my health status. Um, and that makes coverage for many people unaffordable. The common, you know, I, I hear from uh, many people who say I can't afford both health insurance um, and health care. Um, and that's the kind of policy I'm being offered. There's so much left over that I have to pay for that I can't pay the premium on top of that. Um, and hence, we have a sense that many people who are uninsurable, in fact, become uninsured. And we have that sense because we see a lot more people applying for coverage um, and being denied coverage or rated up or being offered um, what we call substandard coverage and exclusion on coverage um, than we see ever go into the high risk pool. Um, in states that have a high-risk pool. Um, amazingly minor conditions um, can, can trigger a denial or a rate-up or an exclusion. Um, Karen Pollitt did a wonderful paper many years ago, we'll all refer to Karen since she's not here today, um, that, that uh, indicated someone even with um, a condition as minor as hay fever. Um, can be denied coverage uh, simply because the cost of the medications um, is a significant proportion of the premium. Um, if I am denied coverage or rated up or um, offered substandard coverage, um, and um, in many states, if I have a uh, qualifying condition, which means if I went to insure, that was bound to happen, um, I have in most states some option. In 35 states, I can go to a state high risk pool, and I'll talk a little bit about what the problems with those have been and how the federal uh, program is different. Um, in five states, I don't have this problem at all. Um, in five states, including Massachusetts, um, I am every carrier that I approach has to make me an offer. Um, also Maine um, and a few others, obviously. A few states have an insurer of last resort system, including DC, um, Michigan, um, a number of other states. That is typically the Blue Cross Blue Shield plan, which has an agreement to cover people in lieu of paying premium taxes to the jurisdiction, to, to the state. Um, and often they um, gauge their obligation um, in terms of the limits of their tax exemption. Um, and stop offering coverage when they reach the limits of their tax exemption. Um, and then in a few states, um, I have nothing um, unless I have those HIPAA protections, unless I'm transferring from group coverage. Um, and I speak to an awful lot of folks who um, do not understand the arcane nature of, of what it requires to invoke HIPAA protection. And if you do invoke HIPAA protection, you should try going to a website and checking the little box and say, yes, I am HIPAA eligible, and look at the premium you are offered for HIPAA coverage. It will soar relative to the premium you are offered if you allow the carrier to medically underwrite and deny you. Um, so HIPAA is a very limited protection. It's very arcane. You have to count your 63 days. Don't let them expire. Um, it's not clear when you should start counting those 63 days, but the magic uh, date is 63. Keep checking. Um, and uh, many, many people miss it. Um, and believe that, for example, they take gap coverage or they'll take catastrophic coverage, they'll take some non-qualifying individual coverage and believe that they still have their HIPAA protections and, in fact, they forfeited them. Um, so that is the high-risk scenario now, and as Len mentioned, there are an awful lot of us in this high-risk scenario, even if you really don't recognize that you are because you think you're very healthy and you may have something very minor wrong with you, but it can trigger a um, vast exclusion um, in coverage when you um, finally go to seek it. Um, 
As I mentioned, 35 states have high-risk pools, and those of us who have been watching those high-risk pools have had mixed feelings about them for many years. Number one, they certainly are better than nothing. Um, and in most states, that's been the alternative. Um, and the staff that work at high-risk pools have struggled mightily to make them as good as they can possibly be against impossible odds. Um, and the impossible odds largely have to do with, with how they're funded. Um, they charge high premiums. Um, the premiums are capped typically at 125 to 175, some at 200 percent of standard rates in the market. And standard rates in the market themselves can be very high if there are no limits on age rating, for example. So if you're going in as a 50-year-old adult who's most likely to have one of those conditions that gets you kicked out of um, a medical underwriting process, um, you're looking at, um, in most states, 150 to 200 percent of that high rate that you would be charged because of of your age to begin with. Um, some states, rarely, California, Florida, um, have enrollment limits. Florida has actually been closed since 1991, and there are a few people lingering in the high-risk pool since then. Um, but uh, California has struggled with their high-risk pool, um, and again, with those financing strains um, on it. And um, they actually have a limit. And if, unless you're HIPAA protected, you go on a waiting list. Um, the waiting list is actually fairly large. It's uh, or long, I should say. I, I understand it's something on the order of six to nine months right now. Um, there are annual and lifetime limits. You can actually blow through um, your your policy um, and. The, most, the greatest irony, I think, to, to me and many others is that there are pre-existing condition exclusions. So again, the very thing that is wrong with you that got you kicked out of the underwriting cycle, you won't have covered for up to a year while you're paying the high premiums for the high risk pool. Um, so clearly these, these um, pools, while they are arguably better than nothing, are marginally better than nothing. Um, and enrollment in these pools typically has been very low. Um, Minnesota is really the best example of a high-risk pool that exists. It's a very large high-risk pool. They keep premiums down below. Uh, they have authority to run premiums to 125% of standard rates. They keep uh, rates really at about 118, 119% of standard rates, have good benefits. It's a very different high-risk pool. You, you went to oh. Medicaid there. You, I'm sorry. I'm totally out of control here. Alan? <laughs> I should be watching my own slides. Okay, okay. Yeah. so, you're, yeah, you take control. <laughs> so what is, I totally, what is the, uh, I can't, I can't deal with my uh, VCR either, it's the same thing. Um, the, um, what does a federal high risk pool do? Um, as I said um, earlier, this is a very temporary. This is, I, mean, I, I called uh, the presentation playing for time for a reason. This is um, simply something to get through to 2014, to get through to the brave new world where, where insurance carriers um, actually have to offer you coverage when you call and ask them for it. Um, and it sets up a high risk pool that is unlike any that exists in the country. And that's part of the anxiety over the funding of it, um, because it is a more welcoming high risk pool in all respects but one. The way that it is more welcoming is that premiums are set equal to market rates. So I get the same rate in the high risk pool that I would get if I was offered underwritten coverage in the market. Um, the, uh, there are no waiting periods. Um, what is wrong with me is covered on day one. Um, I can't blow through my benefit. There's no annual limit on benefits, no lifetime limit on benefits. Um, that is going to be very helpful to, to people who are ill, obviously, or they wouldn't be there. Um, and there is uh, limits on cost sharing. Um, I don't have very high deductibles and co-insurance and co-payments. Um, so arguably, I should be able to afford health care and health insurance at the same time. Um, but there's a, there's a glitch, and that is not everyone can get in. So those taxi drivers um, may, may find that if they did the right thing, they tried to maintain coverage, they won't be eligible for the high-risk pool. Um, I have to have been uninsured for six months. And that means if I'm in one of those high-risk pool pools now um, that is very expensive and very limited, um, I'm still in that high-risk pool. I do not have the option to go into the federal pool unless I am unsatisfied enough, dissatisfied enough of that coverage that I'm actually willing to go bare um, and be uninsured for six months. 
The funding on this uh, federal pool is the, the glitch, um, if you will, in addition to the, um, the waiting period. Um, given this construction of a high-risk pool, which is so unlike any high-risk pool we have ever seen in the States, but so much more like what everyone who has been watching high-risk pools would like, um, forecasting enrollment is very difficult. It's, un, un, it's difficult because we've never seen a high-risk pool like this. Um, and it's also difficult because medical underwriting is a moving target. Um, sometimes carriers are more strict on their medical underwriting, and if they want to increase their volume of business, they become a little less strict on their medical underwriting. Um, so I'm asked often how many people are uninsurable, and the answer is we really don't know. We have no idea. If I use Minnesota's um, num uh, population enrolled in the high risk pool as a percentage of the people in the individual market, I would say 6%. Um, and when I tell carriers I think it's 6%, they blanch. And they say, oh no, it's 1%. <laughs> so, so we don't know how many people would, would apply to this, but we expect it could be a lot. Um, and it may include some of those people currently in state high risk pools who are really desperate enough to go bare for six months. Um, what we believe um, is that $5 billion probably isn't enough to carry us through to 2014. Uh, the uh, Office of the Actuary at CMS thinks it will be good enough for maybe two years, maybe a little longer than two years, um, but we really don't know. So one of the, the uh, issues I think we have before us is to figure out how to stretch dollars in the high risk pool, and that could be to manage care better, to do the chronic care management that surprisingly few high risk pools bother to do, um, when in fact the majority of their population has multiple chronic conditions. Um, and we may be back asking for additional funds, um, or we may be back asking for a change in the uh, authorizing legislation that allows this federal high risk pool to constrain its costs in some, uh, hopefully not all, of the same ways that the state high risk pools do now. Well, thanks to all of you. You may not have realized it, but you all have just sat through what I would classify maybe a, a, a advanced placement course in American history ex, uh, discussion, and now you have the essay question. Which is better, state power or federal power? Explain in a thousand words, and explain the pros and cons of federalism. Because throughout all of these remarks, you've heard that essential tension of American life. Uh, we heard from Scott uh, that as of uh, 2017 and beyond, the range of decisions that states will be able to make about what group size can come into exchange, et cetera, et cetera, uh, will have an amazing impact on the market. Uh, and of course, there's the federal role with the Labor Department doing an annual assessment of what's happening in the exchanges uh, as of that point. So we'll see that federal state tension playing out there. Uh, we heard from John Kingsdale that, uh, about his concern about what's not happening now, which is states taking stock of the major, major change, states and insurers taking stock of the major changes in their industry and now deciding really how to approach things from the ground up. Uh, and particularly as the states, some of the states fight the Civil War all over again, uh, there's even less incentive to seize the opportunities in the legislation to deliver on some of the promise uh, that could be afforded by uh, expanded health coverage. We heard from Len uh, that essentially his take on the law is that it is federal purpose, but the states charged with implementation and doing the regulation pursuant to the federal purpose. Uh, but again, his, his concerns also about uh, to what degree the states are willing to step up to this, notwithstanding the fact that they could and should and have, and we got the geography lesson to him about the, from him about the differences between, say, Massachusetts and Utah, as well as the uh, sociological differences between those two states. And then we heard from Deborah about, again, uh, the difference between the federal high-risk pool approach versus the state high-risk pools approach, and how one of the major concerns will be, among others, whether the Congress appropriated enough money to meet the goals in the first place. And the clear, pretty clear answer is it didn't, if it we're talking about getting lots of people into high-risk pools uh, between now and 2014. So with that, 
Uh, Deborah, let me start by asking you, just in recent days, as you know, the, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement came out and said, uh, or excuse me, the Institute for Healthcare Reform came out and said that as few as 200,000 people will be enrolled in those risk pools. Uh, that is almost nothing. And if it's as low as that, what is that going to do for the public appetite to wait out the reforms uh, that will not come into play until 2014 if they do then, given all the things that we've heard this morning about the decisions that states have to make between now and that? There are. Is it on now? No. Let's get our audio up. Yep. Tr try the other mic, maybe. Yep. Is this on? No. Yes. Oh, okay, just, great. Okay. I just can't hear myself. S speak right into no? the okay. mic. Yep. Um, I think that um, there will be uh, some widespread disappointment that the federal high risk pool, the six month waiting period in the federal high risk pool, um, I think that will be one first line of, of disappointment. The second is I think it's going to be still more expensive. Um, despite the um, limits um, th on, on the premiums, that they be standard market rates, it's going to be more expensive than many people anticipate. I think they expect that it's going to be very inexpensive. Um, so I think there will be a wave of disappointment that the federal high-risk pool isn't the brave new world. It's not 2014. It's not everything people want it to be. Um, at the same time, I think it will, um, that wave of disappointment could, in fact, become constructive. Um, and that it will uh, begin to push um, carriers toward 2014, maybe on a somewhat faster track. I think they've shown in the last um, year, the last six months, um, that they are willing to move forward on some issues on a somewhat faster track. Um, and there may be some pressure for them to do that. I think a lot of carriers could, could turn to 2014 tomorrow. When healthcare reform looked like it was going to go down, I heard major carriers saying, wait a minute, we've been in implementation mode for a year and a half. This can't be true. Um, so I think that, they, that many could move. How they move to take on high risk is another question. I mean, that's, that's a hard thing to imagine, but not an impossible thing to imagine. Um, so we'll see. But I think it will be a wave of disappointment and maybe followed by some constructive pressure. John and Len, I, I want to come back to the question of refighting the Civil War, or maybe to frame it a little more positively, uh, let's, let's go back to my analogy about the powder milk biscuits. How do we give states the courage to get up and do what needs to be done at this point? Uh, because you're both suggesting that you don't see enough activity going on in the states. Uh, and obviously you see lawsuits going on in some of the states uh, in, the, in the extreme form of denial that health reform will ever be, come to pass. What do you think is going to, uh, it, what is it going to take to get states to recognize uh, the importance of uh, getting involved and getting up to speed and implementing exchanges? And uh, let me just ask one other, or add one other observation to that. It was pointed out to me recently that under the legislation, the exchanges have to be the portals, not just for enrollment in private insurance, but also for Medicaid and CHIP. So, if we take these governors and state attorneys general at their word, they're saying they'd rather have the federal government come in and run their Medicaid programs for, from them and do enrollment and everything else because they don't want to set up these exchanges. Is this what we're looking at? Both of you. Well, let me go back to your first question, how do we get states to engage? And I think the first answer is you clone John Kingsdale and send him around the country. And, and John is better than anybody I know at explaining how you do this and how you can do this. A lot of people who are skeptical and indeed fearful of the law um, haven't yet been able to think through things that don't exist in front of them. And so, the and you know, let's be frank, in parts of the country, Massachusetts is sort of like France, you know. They, <laughs> they like each other up there and they're all rich. And so fundamentally it, it's, <laughs> It's, it's got this baseball team. So, you know, they, they, they need to see how it can happen. And I know John has made himself now available to the world, and so we're going to put him on a plane and send him out there. The second thing is, I think, I mean, I'm an economist, you know, so I think you've got to show people the money. I, I think you show business elites 
how much money is going to flow in if you do this. I mean, yeah, they have to, the Urban Institute just came out with an estimate of the just Medicaid alone. And, you know, I'll put John Hollihan's knowledge of the Medicaid program up against anybody's in terms of estimating the, the data and the numbers. And, and he estimated, on average, states are going to have to spend 1.4 percent more than they spend now. And the federal government's going to spend 22 percent more than they spend now. And just to give you a concrete example, in the state of Arkansas, you're looking at something like $100 million being raised by the state in one year to get $2 billion. Now, you know, the people of Arkansas are not exactly going to win the Nobel Prize in nuclear physics on average, but they can do that math, and that's a pretty damn good rate of return. So when you show the business elite that this is going to be coming in and that this indeed is like a stimulus package for a lot of these southern states that are pretty red, then they start thinking about the cars they're going to sell and the homes they're going to keep and so forth. And then you have a coterie that go to the governor and say, maybe you ought to tone down a Civil War speech here. Maybe you ought to take a second look. And by the way, here's how to make it work. I don't know what else to do. Well, John, uh, before we come by and scrape a few of your skin cells so we can do somatic cell nuclear transfer and create more of you, uh, what's your sense of how we get the states to engage? Well, Len's going to have to give me uh, elocution lessons so I can talk to uh, some of those states. Take me with you. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay preacher. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think uh, his first comment aside, uh, what Len is saying makes a lot of sense. Uh, show, show me the green, you know, show me the dollars. It's a pretty strong case. And, of course, ironically, this, many of the states that have the highest uninsured uh, are the states that will get the most leverage, the highest dollars um, that people in Massachusetts will be paying to support them in Texas and Florida and elsewhere, uh, even though we do talk funny, like those people in France. Um, <clears throat> I think the other thing is to get a couple of olives out of the state, uh, out of the bottle. There are a few states that are raring to go, and it's just as important that if Sacramento is going to be one of the first to go, or you know, probably some other states, they do it right. Um, I think that means the federal government should be bending over backwards. I know there's this sort of thing about you know who, who's smarter and who can do it better. But the feds will, those in Washington who want this to work, should give those, whether in Sacramento or somewhere else, that want to be the brave first few, as much help, as much support. There is nothing, and I think Massachusetts has proved it, even as foreign a state as Massachusetts was a pretty powerful example. And I'm sure Alan Weil can think of a couple of other states that uh, we could support. Um, and speaking of local, um, and speaking of uh, economics, get the local folks involved. Uh, I think there's a tendency to go to, I don't know, I'm going to pull some names, some initials out of the NFIB or NAM or the U.S. Chamber and say, okay, we've got, what, 50 billion or trillion or some 50 something or other in tax uh, credits for small business. Now, will you help us? And they say, you know, and I don't want to speak for them. I don't know what they said, but, you know, a bunch of people in this town say, no, we're not going to help you do anything. Well, go out to Des Moines. There's a chamber of commerce, I guarantee you, in Des Moines that would love to take credit with its small business membership for figuring out how to get $20 million of additional federal credits into their hands. Go out into those communities. Get out of Washington. Great. Scott, anything to add from your perspective? Yeah, I, I think uh, I, I completely agree uh, with John on getting the states vested. I've been out uh, uh, to talk to some states and testified in state legislatures, and I think uh, actually they're they're quite pleased uh, at the flexibility they have with respect to the exchange, and I think that's a that's a, a point that can't be understated. I think the the second thing that I would say is that uh, I talked about the all-important first year and learning the lessons of Medicaid. Uh, the, the lessons of Medicaid are sort of the subset of my concern about the all-important first year because, as Len indicated, in the policy community, we like to compartmentalize people and think about them fitting in nice, neat, nice, neat boxes. But as my old boss used to like to say, you know, nobody aspires to be poor. Uh, so people who are at 133 don't aspire to stay at 133. 
Um, Meaning 133% um, so, of the federal poverty level. Correct, the, the Medicaid level, thank you. And so I really worry about two populations. Uh, the first are the tweeners, uh, the people who are cycling potentially in and out of public and private coverage, people who are between 100 to 150 uh, in particular. And the second set of population that I worry about are those that are sort of in the heart of the middle class, uh, the, the people who are in the 250 range. With a lot of cases, folks who are just above uh, S-chip limits. Uh, and I worry about them for two reasons. From a policy standpoint, a quality improvement standpoint, we know that mom, dad, and the kids all do better when they're on the same policy, when they can have the same primary care provider. Uh, and I can't understate the point uh, of how clinically important this is, particularly in communities where, again, we're going to face capacity challenges. Uh, and the second point about that population is anybody who looked at the CBO tables uh, for that population that is sort of the middle, middle people who vote, uh, you know, can't come away not being scared with the percent of income that they're going to have to contribute out of pocket and as a share of premium. It's something that we're concerned about in the industry. But the other thing that I would add is this requires an education, which is going to be very difficult, of things like actuarial value, which is that when you talk about actuarial value, that is an average for that population. So in other words, if a low-income family is in a policy that's bronze, they're not always going to be paying 40% of out-of-pocket because thankfully we have an out-of-pocket maximum. So again, people who are spend, who are high spenders and vulnerable will learn, but we do really worry about those two populations. Great. We have time for just a couple of quick questions before we move on to the next panel. So let's take one right here. And again, if you would identify yourself by name and affiliation, that would be very helpful. Sure. My name is Mike Collins. I'm a low-level staffer on Capitol Hill. Uh, and my question is, uh, how can Congress help and how can Congress hurt over the next implementation phase? Lynn? And then Scott, because you expressed some skepticism about Congress's helpfulness. Well, that is a great question. And I, I guess at the moment what I would say is um, make it have a sense of the whatever house you're in that the intent is indeed to make this a participation sport. The intent is indeed to engage the different states where they are and try to make this work. And I would just say, if I mean, I know this, if you asked me, so I'll say it. Um, put down the partisan rhetoric for one hour. One hour. You know, kind of like those, those moments of silence we have for fallen uh, great ones and so forth. Have one hour where you put it down and you say, what this is about is making our health care system work for all Americans, all of them, not just those who vote in a particular way. And just lead by example for one hour. Maybe it'll catch on. Scott? I, I think uh, the, the first thing that Congress uh, can do to help uh, is to get out to their states, to talk to their regulators, uh, to talk to local elected officials, and to help them really understand uh, the choice set uh, with, with respect to the exchanges and understand their marketplaces. Because I think that uh, it's, it's fair to say, and I don't mean this is any insult, that uh, most members of Congress don't understand the marketplaces. The second thing uh, that I would add is that's sort of uh, more of an immediate. But the long term, I think it's critical uh, that members of Congress sort of understand uh, the limits uh, of the uh, institutional capacity uh, to effectuate many of the provisions. So I think, uh, as I said, particularly with respect to delivery, I worry that CMS will be doing everything that they can just to do the access piece and that it's going to be really hard to keep some of the delivery pieces on pace, which again, for me, is the big lesson of Massachusetts, that if we don't do those two together, we're going to build an unsustainable system. Just on that point, uh, with uh, Don Berwick's appointment to head CMS apparently held up in the Senate because of some sort of silent hold that's been put on his nomination. How worried is your industry about phenomena like that continuing to play out largely as a consequence of politics? 
Uh, I think, uh, as, as I also said, uh, I thought Len's uh, paper was brilliant. Uh, and he described the biggest problem as being political. And as I indicated, I think sometimes the technical uh, bleeds into the political. Uh, so for example, I would say on the issue of uh, hospital readmissions uh, or uh, value-based purchasing, things that Dr. Berwick knows a lot about, we do have some time, but nonetheless, it's critical that elements uh, like uh, risk adjustment, which is not only important in the insurance context, but understanding very important in the context of hospital readmissions. And for me, uh, if we don't move beyond three conditions in 2015, I think, to me, that, that will be a complete failure. Uh, I think we have to. John. Um, I, I just want to pick up on uh, Len's, you know, sort of request or prayer maybe um, for a little goodwill. Let me put in the negative. The easiest way for Congress to impede this is going to be insist, to insist that all, and I don't know what they are, but maybe 1,000 deadlines be made and make a press story out of every one that's missed by more than a nanosecond. Um, and if that's going to be the attitude, um, boy, there's just going to be a story a day for the next four years. I mean, you got to sort of step back and do a little bit of the big picture. Do you actually, you know, do we somehow get a spirit where we want this to do the main things? Because we're not going to get it 100% right. Very good. All right, well, with that warning about uh, the excesses of the news media in overcovering state implemageddon, uh, we will all take that under advisement. And th join me in thanking this panel for a terrific discussion. Well, I have the pleasure now of introducing several, or, or a number of authors who participated in our uh, Medicaid uh, portion of the issue, as well as a, a broader political and fiscal critique of, of, uh, of health reform. And let me introduce them to you now. First, we'll hear from Leighton Koo, the director of the Center for Health Policy Research and a professor of health policy at George Washington University. He's a nationally known expert, as many of you will know, on Medicaid, CHIP, national and state health reform and access to care for vulnerable populations. In addition to his research and policy analyses, he's worked with federal and state officials and other national and local organizations to strengthen access to health care. Before joining GW, he was a senior fellow at the Center for Budget and Policy Priorities and a principal researcher at the Urban Institute. We'll then hear from Alan Weil, who with Ray Shapak uh, was the co-author of, uh, of uh, a paper in this issue of Health Affairs. Alan is executive director of the National Academy for State Health Policy, a position he's held since September 2004. He previously was director of the Urban Institute's Assessing the New Federalism Project. So the conversation we had earlier is deeply familiar to Alan. Prior to that, he was executive director of the Colorado Department of Healthcare Policy and Financing. He was also health policy advisor to Colorado Governor Roy Romer. Uh, he's the editor of two books. He publishes regularly in peer-reviewed journals such as ours. He's on our editorial board at Health Affairs and is also a member of the Institute of Medicine's Board on Healthcare Services, as well as the Commonwealth Fund's Commission on a High Performance Health System and the Kaiser Commission on Medicaid and the Uninsured. And then we're delighted also to have with us Tom Miller, resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, where he focuses on health policy, with a particular emphasis on information transparency, health insurance regulation, and consumer-driven health care. He was a member of the National Advisory Council for the Agency of Healthcare Research and Quality from 2007 to 2009. Before joining AEI, he, was a, he served for three years as a senior health economist for the Joint Economic Committee, where he organized a series of hearings focusing on reforms in private health care markets. He's also been a director of health policy studies at the Cato Institute and director of economic policy studies at the Competitive Enterprise Institute. <laughs>
And then finally, Ray Shapak is with us, again, a co-author of the paper with Alan. He's the executive director of the National Governors Association, a position that he's held since 1983. At NGA, he manages all aspects of the association and the NGA's Center for Best Practices. He also facilitates the association's efforts to achieve the major missions of producing information and analysis of state innovations and practices, as well as creating a bipartisan partisan forum for governors to establish and implement policy on federal issues, this one obviously being a major case in point. He previously worked for seven years at the Congressional Budget Office, the last two years as Deputy Director, and was also previous to that Vice President and Senior Consultant for Economic Studies at Jack Fawcett Associates and an economist with the Standard Oil Company of Ohio. So let us turn first to Leighton Koo speaking about uh, his his paper on the Medicaid expansion. Leighton. Uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, for having me. And once again, I'd like to heap praise on the issue of health affairs. Uh, actually, I've already assigned uh, a number of articles from this to my students this summer. This summer, I have them working on implementation of health reform. And I hope that by the end of the summer, they will have solved all these problems. This conference is coming a little too early, therefore. Uh, but anyway, on to Medicaid. Uh, I like to think of Medicaid as being uh, essentially sort of the, the workforce of the health insurance system. It's the largest insurer in the U.S. now, uh, but it's sort of drab, uh, often contrary. Uh, people often cuss at it a lot. Uh, and it, 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 it is all those things, but it gets the job done. Uh, historically in the U.S., we've done a pretty good job of covering certain populations. For the elderly, there's been Medicare for a long time. Uh, in recent years, we've done a lot to expand coverage for children uh, in both Medicaid and CHIP. And finally, with the Affordable Care Act, we're getting around to deal with where the big gap has been, which is low-income adults. Uh, in this slide, I simply want to sort of portray the, 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 the sense of how large the expansion is, effectively speaking. Right now, for parents, uh, in a typical state, and it varies from state to state, uh, the Medicaid eligibility line is about 64% of poverty. Uh, that's around $14,000 for a family of four. If you make more than that, you're too rich to qualify for health insurance assistance. Uh, by 2014, uh, this will go up. People usually are talking about 133% of poverty. There's actually a 5% standard deduction thrown in. So it's really effectively to 138% of poverty will be the eligibility limit by then. So it's going to more than double to $30,000 or so uh, in today's dollars. So this is a big expansion. That pales in comparison to the expansion for adults who don't have children. Adults who don't have children, in general, are not eligible for Medicaid at all in most states in the country. Uh, so it's going to go from nothing to, for example, for a single person, around $15,000 uh, in eligibility. Again, these are still pretty low income levels. Nonetheless, these are huge expansions in terms of coverage uh, for low income adults. Uh, one of the things that was very fortunate in the legislation, the governors were very successful in saying, hey, look, we can't afford uh, the expansion under the current terms. Uh, we really need the federal government to carry most of the weight. And so for the first three years, uh, the federal government will pay all the costs for the expansions. They'll also help some states that expanded earlier. Uh, in addition to that, uh, over time, that'll phase down to 90% or so. One of the things that's important to think about this population, however, is it's a little heterogeneous. Most of the people that we're, we're going to be expanding coverage to are relatively healthy, young adults, middle-aged people. Uh, and, and so they'll come and they'll have relatively low cost. But some have much more serious health conditions. So some, particularly among the very poor childless adults, we're talking about people who in many cases might be homeless, might be substance users, may have very complex problems. Uh, and so for them, there are more serious issues uh, about the, the, the nature of the health care. And also, some will be middle-aged adults who are getting to that point, like me, where you know, you're beginning to have chronic conditions. So the health needs begin to rack up a little. In terms of thinking about the changes, the, the, the policies already have begun to have effects. Uh, right now, states are prohibited from reducing their Medicaid or CHIP eligibility levels. There are certain exceptions. Uh, this has already had some impacts. For example, for Arizona, wanted to eliminate its CHIP program uh, basically because of these prohibitions. Uh, it can't do that. 
Uh, states may begin expansions for the adults early, so some states are considering this, including states like D.C. and Connecticut. In the very near future, uh, and in fact it's already begun, both the federal government and the states will begin the serious planning and the systems development that are necessary for the big expansion. And then the big expansion happens in January 2014. Um, and at that point, we're going to have sort of a requirement of expansion of eligibility for the non-elderly adults. Uh, the non-elderly adults, when they're covered, will not be getting exactly the same benefit package that they have in Medicaid today. It'll be slightly narrower. It'll be, by design, more comparable to private health insurance coverage uh, than the, the Medicaid package, which is, generally speaking, somewhat more comprehensive in terms of what it's covering. One of the things that's interesting, and Len Nichols noted it uh, very nicely, it's, it's both interesting and important, but also a little tricky, is the notion that there's supposed to be coordinated enrollment between Medicaid, CHIP, and, and the, the, the subsidies that are gonna be available under the health insurance exchanges. The concept really is that there's supposed to be a no wrong door policy, that people, regardless of how they come in, whether they're, they think they're applying for Medicaid, for CHIP, uh, for the subsidies or the health insurance exchange, that no matter where they come in, there will be a simple application system that will somehow channel them appropriately to the right program. And as was noted, this is tricky because people's status is dynamic, so it may be changing over time, and having those coordinations may be difficult. Now, part of the additional challenge is that this planning should begin in advance, but of course, some of this is also contingent on what happens with the health insurance exchanges, and we don't know what's happening there. So this makes this uh, also a little more complicated. It's, it's a little easier for states who have experience with Medicaid and CHIP to know some of the basics. Uh, and those programs, the health insurance exchanges and the subsidies, uh, we're moving into more unknown territory. Um, I guess, so, so it's possible though. I mean, that's the thing that's important to bear in mind is despite these challenges, these things have been done. Again, drawing on the example of Massachusetts, Massachusetts set up uh, a great online virtual gateway to help guide people into the correct uh, program that was appropriate given their income level uh, and given what they were eligible for uh, in terms of eligibility. So things like this could be used. They use that online gateway. They work closely with a number of community organizations, with healthcare providers to, to try and develop this screen and enrollment system. So it's possible to do these things. Nonetheless, there's some big challenges. And I guess I, it seems to me that, that we have to think about three big challenges that are ahead. One is, will the healthcare system be ready? We're going to see a large expansion. People think maybe something on the order of 16 million more people will join the Medicaid program. Uh, and so it's a fair question. Will there be the healthcare providers uh, to provide access? We know that in general, uh, in some cases, healthcare providers uh, don't want to serve Medicaid patients. Are we going to continue to have problems with that? The legislation includes some policy so that uh, primary care physician payment rates are going to be elevated in 2013 and 2014 to 100% of the Medicare payment levels, and that ought to help, but that might not be enough in and of itself. States may think of other ways they could do things to sort of make it easier for physicians to participate in Medicaid, to reduce the hassles that are often involved in being paid, just to make that system work a little easier uh, to be more fit friendly to physicians and to encourage them to participate. The other big element that we haven't talked a lot about is there's going to be a large expansion of community health centers, and community health centers uh, very much are dedicated to serving Medicaid patients and the uninsured, a and that expansion will also help ensure that there, there are going to be more primary care providers available. Will it be enough? Will it work perfectly? Uh, you know, we'll see. But there are certainly components in the legislation that are trying to address some of these issues in which the legislation has been you know, proactive in thinking about what were some of the problems that already occurred and how can we try to address some of those problems. The big question, the big controversy in this bill relating to Medicaid uh, really focused on how much it was going to cost. And it wasn't so much even the federal cost, though obviously the federal cost is substantial. One of the big questions that kept on coming up over and over again, and I'm sure we're going to hear more about it later today, is how much was it going to cost states? Um, states were, have already thought of Medicaid in many cases as the Pac-Man of state budgets consuming uh, state budgets at a, at a rapid pace. Uh, and we all know that states are in deep financial trouble today. So this is obviously a very serious problem. 
Uh, the Congressional Budget Office estimated that the federal government would spend around a little more than $400 billion over the next 10 years for the Medicaid expansion. States would have to spend about $20 billion more. The Urban Institute just recently came out with estimates that are of a similar nature. So yes, states will have to pay more. Actually, some states will save money. Some states will have to spend money. But the, relatively speaking, they're going to be getting far more federal dollars than they're going to have to be putting out in state dollars. So it's really a very advantageous situation from states uh, on balance. But probably the thing that's important to bear in mind is that at the point when the cost really soar, which is in 2014, we're all expecting, and hopefully this will be the case, that state budgets will be in better situations by then. So when some of these costs really begin to occur, the states, which are right now experiencing very, very serious financial problems, will be in better shape, better able to accommodate some of those costs. On the other hand, as Len Nichols mentioned, part of the problem is right now, and it's over the next couple of years, and then particularly in 2012, 2013, states need to be planning and developing systems. And this will not necessarily be cheap. This will require expertise. This will require them to develop new reimbursement systems, new managed care systems, new, pay, uh, new you know, eligibility systems, uh, to hire new people to do the enrollment uh, into the systems. All these developmental activities have to be born during a time when the states are having some serious financial problems. And this can cause uh, some, some serious reasons to worry that there could be some problems going on. And hopefully that's a role that the federal government and other groups like foundations could play in really trying to help out during this particular financial pinch. Um, I'll mention another thing that is particularly problem and it's topical right now, is that we don't know whether the FMAP extension is going to occur. It's a little frustrating that despite the fact that both the House and the Senate have passed extensions of the FMAP increase, that's the extraditional federal aid for another six months. Though each of them have passed an extension, they have not passed it together, so therefore we don't have that law yet and hopefully that will still come to be. Um, so the state budget problems are serious, uh, an obvious and serious issue. The other element uh, really has to do with the political issue that we were just hearing about in the last uh, discussion. We do know that 21 states, for example, have uh, raised a lawsuit to oppose uh, the, the, the health care reform law, uh, and there's obviously serious political division about this. What this graph is basically showing is that uh, you know, paradoxically, the states that are opposed to this are actually the states that have the most to gain. When you look at this is estimates that we did of the percentage of the Medicaid eligible adults who are currently uninsured uh, in these states, the states that are the opposing states, as I call them, the 21 states that sued, uh, have on average 39% of that population is uninsured. All these people could be covered by the Medicaid expansions. Billions and billions of dollars would be coming in in new federal resources to these states if they would cover them. Uh, in contrast, the states that are not opposed with the other states that have not sued, uh, it's 26 percent. Uh, are uninsured. So they too can gain in terms of additional federal dollars, but they're not going to gain as much, relatively speaking, as the states that are, uh, that are opposing it. So you know, part of an underlying question is, uh, how can we help convince states that it's in the economic and health interest of their own residents to actually you know, begin to see the value in these expansions, to see the value in the health reform law, that this can help them out? Thanks. Thank you. I want to add my congratulations to Susan and her team at Health Affairs for pulling this issue together in such uh, short order, and my co-author, Ray Shapak, who you'll hear from momentarily. Um, it is, I have to say, as someone who came to Washington almost 15 years ago, directly out of state government, refreshing to hear so much attention paid to states. Uh, this is new and exciting and wonderful. Uh, it is also challenging because I'm used to not having to uh, think about what other people on panels talk about because they never mention states and then I just come and say, by the way, pay attention to states, but that is not the case today. And uh, so despite the refreshing change, it also makes my presentation a little more challenging. Um, 
the state to do list, if you will, has been mentioned by others. So my goal will be to expand, uh, which is hard to do given how much has been said, uh, on uh, the key features of what uh, tasks states are going to confront uh, as they implement the uh, health reform legislation. Uh, we've just heard from Layton uh, about the Medicaid eligibility expansion, and there really are two key challenges associated with this. One is the delivery system capacity. Uh, the good news is some aspects of the Medicaid program are relatively scalable, uh, but providers and hospitals and health plans are not all uh, as scalable as some other systems. So we are, and, and to just keep a little focus on the reality here, we are talking about a potential expansion of approximately 50 percent in many st in the average state in the size of the Medicaid program. So we're not just talking about a little bit of growth here. We're talking about a dramatic level of growth that will place significant increased demands on the delivery side. The other is the administrative side. Uh, Len mentioned, and Leighton as well, around the eligibility systems. I just uh, need to give you a little feel for what this is like. In most states, Medicaid eligibility is determined on a county basis, through, primarily through county welfare agencies. Those agencies generally report through a social services agency, not through the agency that runs the Medicaid program. And so we're, and we have uh, the promise of dramatic simplification of Medicaid eligibility uh, criteria. The new uh, eligibility grouping uh, is based on a much simpler definition of income than traditional Medicaid programs. Uh, but changing from this welfare-based eligibility infrastructure to one that can actually handle these new simpler rules is a massive technology and uh, intergovernmental state local challenge that uh, has to happen in very short order. That also has to feed up to the federal government because you have to have data transfer uh, with the IRS, uh, with labor, um, and, and other uh, agencies. So we have a major systems, uh, not just technology, but also administrative systems uh, project ahead of us in a very short time to carry out the Medicaid expansion. The second area is commercial health insurance regulation. Uh, Len uh, described, of course, that states are already uh, the lead uh, locus for that, this activity. Uh, but again, just to put a little reality around it, most state insurance commissioners, uh, health is just one of their lines. They're doing life, property, and casualty. In California, you have a managed care agency. In Rhode Island, you have a health insurance commissioner. But generally, insurance commissioners are not just thinking about health care. They're thinking a lot about solvency because you don't want plans to go under and people to be left uncovered. But when we move to the areas that are anticipated for states around rate review and rate increase review, that is not a, a, a heavy uh, a, a task in many of the states, despite the fact that regulation uh, resides at that level. Um, when it comes to quality and access, in many states that activity is delegated out to a, to a health agency because the insurance commissioner doesn't know a lot about health delivery systems. So that kind of fragmentation has to be uh, pulled together to do effective review once we start not just talking about dollars and uh, solvency. And then, of course, if all of these efforts to do accountable care organizations and other new delivery systems come out, that could dramatically increase the number of potentially regulated entities uh, that states have not traditionally had as much of a focus on. So this is, again, it's true the locus stays in the same place, but the nature of the task changes uh, qualitatively. And the insurance exchange uh, development has been discussed uh, thoroughly. Uh, John uh, uh, laid out, I think, very nicely the six issues and, uh, and noted that there's no one answer for all states. And so one of the things that Ray and I talk about uh, in the paper is that there really is this fundamental question that is not uh, necessarily so ideological, which is given how complex these tasks are, given how hard it is to do risk adjustment, how hard it is to decide how to do plan uh, uh, selection, uh, it may be rational for a state to choose to not 
build an exchange and turn to the federal government and say, you know, we just don't have the capacity to do this. Now, that has significant implications, uh, but we shouldn't confuse the politics, uh, which are, of course, a big deal right now, with the uh, merits of a choice of whether or not particularly smaller states, uh, when so much of this work is scalable, uh, the cost per person is going to be quite high in smaller states. So the choice of whether or not to even uh, go down this path is a critical one. There are dozens, if not hundreds, of other provisions. I won't uh, go through them all, of course. Uh, there's the new Center for Innovations, uh, opportunities around dual eligibles, changes around payment, uh, the new MAC PAC, to, uh, to, uh, which was uh, created in, in the CHIP reauthorization legislation to look at payment and access in Medicaid and CHIP. Many new data collection requirements, public health grants, states as employee, employers have their own employees and retirees to work with. Uh, states are doing this all at a time of tremendous strain. So what will they need to succeed? Well, they'll need knowledge. They need to know not just what's in the legislation, they need to be able to track this onslaught of, of regulations and decisions and directives that are coming out of the federal government. They're going to need executive branch leadership. Uh, clearly, the state legislatures need to be heavily involved in this, but at the end of the day, this is an implement, implementation task. It has to come out of the executive branch for the leadership. States are going to need strategic and operational plans uh, along, uh, along the lines of, uh, of of what was done with the Recovery Act, with the high-tech provisions. Uh, states need to be thinking about where they're going, and I think John Kingsdale's exactly right. The change here is so large, it has not been the norm for states to step back and say, what are we trying to achieve here? What are our goals? Not just within the exchange, as he described, but with health reform more broadly. Uh, we just released at my organization a paper uh, that describes the 10 things that states have to get right to get implementation right. And part of that is uh, reaches out into population health measures using data, purchasing clout, uh, and, and uh, effective regulation. You really need to think about uh, what are you trying to achieve with this? What can you uh, use as a focal point for the decisions? Otherwise, you're faced with a list of choices and a list of implementation tasks without reasons uh, to guide you in those choices. But for states to step back and make those strategic decisions is going to be very hard. From those, you need to do a needs assessment, what resources you're going to require. At this time, it's very hard to find them. And then, of course, you need to take on these short-term issues. The high-risk pools have already come down the line. And uh, the, the goal here is to look out into the future while you're also tackling the short-term concerns. Uh, so we've identified uh, four conditions for success. I'm sure there are more, but I think these are the cornerstone. Uh, there's been a lot of talk, more talk today about federalism than I think I've heard at any uh, public event I've been to since uh, I came to Washington. Uh, we are going to need a dynamic approach to federalism. Th there is a, a tension inherent in the implementation of this legislation. Um, there are, uh, there, there is concern that if the federal guidelines are too loose, that some states will do a bad job and that the federal government will be held accountable for failing to implement the law and achieving some of the uniformity uh, that is uh, promised in the federal uh, presentations. There is also a tremendous risk that if the federal government is overly prescriptive, states will either check out and say, you do it, or uh, express resistance, uh, which will be very frustrating, or uh, it just might be that the federal government could be wrong in their choices. Uh, every once in a while this happens, and, um, and we would never learn how to do things better because the states were told you must do it this way. And the balance here uh, of enabling the right amount of flexibility so we can learn and tailor to local conditions while we have some national coherence, you can't write that in a statute. You have to work it through issue by issue. This is going to be uh, critical for success. Second is stakeholder engagement. Uh, my only additional comment here beyond the ones that have already been made today is that 
I spent a lot of time in the national health policy community. I guess that's you know you guys out in the audience, uh, and and us up here. Um, there, it, despite the comment that uh, everyone here is a lawyer, it, everyone talks like an economist. I mean, we all talk about incentives and how we're going to drive improvements and new markets and models. Uh, when you go out and talk to people who deliver healthcare, they talk like professionals, not like economists. And although they are frustrated when incentives are wrong, they are more frustrated when they are treated solely as economic actors than as professionals who are trying to do a good job, sometimes against forces that, uh, that, that, that uh, push the wrong direction, as we all confront. We need to engage the people who actually do this on the terms that make sense to them, not just on the terms that work for the Congressional Budget Office. And they are then the envoy to the public engagement, because the primary place that people in the long run or in the medium run are going to get information about how health reform is playing out is not uh, the political leadership, but it's the uh, health professionals that they in interact with. Third, we need state-to-state -state learning. This is uh, what my organization does every day. Uh, I don't need to say a lot more, except that there is so much to do here, uh, and there's so much we don't know, uh, that uh, we do need to support the leaders. We need to bring everyone along. We need to harness the talent and uh, knowledge, and we need to create knowledge as states experiment and learn what does and what doesn't work. And finally, uh, states will uh, need vision, leadership, uh, commitment, and a willingness to take risks. And I guess I just want to end on a slightly more positive note, given the concerns, uh, uh, the references to uh, the Civil War and other divisive uh, moments in our history. Um, the first thing I want to say is that uh, I work a lot with state uh, health officials who are not uh, the cabinet officers and are, and are not the governors. There is a tremendous amount of work going on at the state level to implement this legislation, even in the states where there are leaders saying, this is the worst thing that's ever happened. Because there are people whose job it is to carry out the law. And uh, that's what they're doing. So there's more activity than you might imagine. And there is this thing we're going to have in November called an election. And there's just no way that between now and then the rhetoric, you're not, uh, we're not going to get Len's hour between now and November. <laughs> <laughs> but after November, we're going to have more than half of the governors are going to be new. And they're going to be in office through 2014. And even if they ran on a platform of this is the worst thing that's ever happened, they are going to be accountable to their citizens and to their health sector for effective implementation of this legislation. And so now is not the right time to gauge state level commitment. We're still in the political campaign. I don't want to pretend that it'll end in November, it will not. But the tone of it and the terms of it will change. And I think that's the positive uh, platform that we'll have to work forward through these issues uh, into 2014 and beyond. And now for something uh, entirely different. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here as a biblical outlier. Uh, I have not yet seen the resurrection of effective and sustainable health care reform quite yet. Uh, the original premise for my article for the issue uh, was uh, to explain how political factors shape the evolution and final nature of this massive health care law. Uh, this latest two-year legislative enterprise resulted in a rather messy, just-in-time, late-term delivery of what we might term health reform with multiple political birth defects. Uh, despite the best efforts of some energetic uh, cheerleading squads in town and even in this room today, uh, there's still some uncertainty, if not serious doubt, as to just how sustainable this legislative edifice might turn out to be. Uh, in that regard, although it's not within the scope of uh, my uh, remarks in uh, my article, uh, we'll be uh, taking a different look at at a, uh, uh, an initial checkup of uh, Welcome to Health Reform next Tuesday at AEI, looking at uh, some of the concerns of the employer community uh, and uh, state governments in terms of what they're coping with in Medicaid. And, and there's some different views in terms of how high-risk pools have been designed and operating. There'll be an article coming out in National Affairs, we go beyond health sometimes, uh, talking about uh, a different way to design them and many of the flaws in the current cobbled together structure in the legislation. But back to our uh, primary story after the product placement and the cross-marketing. Uh, 
I've analogized our longstanding uh, political and policy battles over what's been called health care, national health reform, as the equivalent of our own Hundred Years' War uh, that started with Teddy Roosevelt's first bull moose proposal uh, near the beginning of the last century. Uh, except that the original Hundred Years' War from 1337 to 1453 to determine which royal house could claim the French throne was resolved more clearly and in a slightly less medieval manner than our modern day struggles over health reform. Uh, so my primary mission today is to provide a rapid fire overview of the key points of my article about uh, health reform politics, relying on the old standbys of oversimplification, exaggeration, and parody, uh, and then uh, pretend to link this up to the topic of concern to the rest of this panel, uh, the opportunities, challenges, and burdens that states will face under this newest iteration of health reform proposals that actually became law and not just political theater. Uh, but because I'm on the clock, uh, I'll resort to the, yelled at it, the adage that a picture is worth a thousand words and a motion picture delivers tens of thousands more. Uh, so let's get going here. Okay, uh, here are the five recurring images of the various interrelated political strategies uh, and factors behind the final sale of this legislation by late March. Uh, perhaps the uh, most urgent and important political objective was to make uh, national health reform appear to be less costly, uh, particularly in a government budget sense, uh, and to be less disruptive both to current uh, health care arrangements and many Americans' traditional views, at least outside this room in this city, of the limited role of the federal government. Hence the need for various I brought in additional firepower to handle this. Uh, let me run here. Well, it's the smoke screen in any case. We're in the, there we go, okay. Uh, the, the need for various smoke screens that could obscure or portray more appealingly the underlying fiscal and economic features of the proposed health reform plan. Uh, that's a depiction of the uh, naval origins of the term as we see the USS Obamacare uh, steaming out to a town hall meeting near one of the coastal cities. Um, some key elements here included uh, coming to an initial truce with employer-sponsored health insurance plans, at least to keep more private money on the table during the first installment of required insurance coverage growth. Uh, insurance coverage mandates could enlist the money of employers and individuals to help fund additional health spending that could, would not be fully counted as spending or taxes in the federal budget. Now, relying on expanded Medicaid eligibility through state channels could operate as a less expensive, there we go, good i got to get lined up here. I'm going to kill you, Ray. Uh, <laughs> well, and a less expensive hamburger helper uh, to accomplish about half of the total targeted coverage goals by allowing federal dollars to be stretched further, uh, given uh, Medicaid's very low reimbursement rates for health care providers. And, and even without donning the more politically flammable wardrobe of a public plan option that hinted at the uh, designer house of single payer, the architects of the final law uh, were able to combine vastly expanded public plan Medicaid coverage with much tighter political regulation of private insurers uh, in subsidized health insurance exchanges of the perhaps near future to accomplish most of the larger political objectives of increased dependency on politically brokered health care. Those were all twofers, uh, both a smoke screen uh, and a uh, budget meal extender of hamburger helper. Uh, another essential part of the political strategies and tactics was the need uh, by the respective political sides in Congress either to beat the clock uh, or run it out. Uh, the strategy of Hill Republicans, particularly given their minority status and the procedural delaying tools of the Senate, was to urge a go slower approach while grassroots concerns about the health reform bill uh, grew across the countryside. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the tyranny of the shortening congressional calendar in the fall of 2009 left congressional Democrats scrambling to get their health reform plans into law before their sizable majorities in the public's limited patients might fade away in the November 2010 election cycle. This political time pressure worked in several swirling directions, sometimes at cross purposes, as the health care bill moves closer to enactment. And even when the political clock seemed to strike midnight in Massachusetts in January, it turned out to be a false alarm. Uh, because it turned out that President Obama uh, and his congressional allies were determined to bet it all on red, uh, not red state, but red ink, uh, and stake his presidency on winning enactment of some less refined version of their original health reform plan by whatever means it took. Uh, each side ultimately resolved to go for broke and just win baby, as Al Davis used to say before his raiders uh, boarded their lost ark. Uh, the result is a legislative child before us today whose parents tell us it's going to grow up to be better than it looks, uh, but is the unfortunate offspring 
of some single party partisan cloning. Uh, before we uh, close the book on this political short story, what about the states and those uh, three stooges of health reform? Uh, well, one of the early political strategies of the Obama White House was to co-opt potentially hostile groups by cutting deals that uh, protected them against downside political risks of the uncertain future in return for commitments of upfront support. And that may have worked in the near term for several more politically adroit sectors uh, that gave it the office early and often. Uh, but other groups just played the role of political stooges, with some kept hanging on a political leash with no tangible political benefits in return. Uh, Larry still has his AMA membership card, but its growth looks less sustainable these days. Uh, and, and then there were others serving as political foils when the White House marketing campaign switched from health reform to health insurance reform and needed a private sector villain. Uh, Curley's still waiting to make up his premium rate losses on increased customer volume uh, at AHIP. Uh, the state governments uh, face unprecedented fiscal pressures, uh, yet expected to make silk purses out of health coverage uh, from the sow's ears of overstretched Medicaid programs, are supposed to hang on without changing uh, current eligibility and benefits until uh, enhanced uh, federal matching funds uh, and more made in Washington mandates arrive in 2014. Uh, some of them are feeling, though, like the last stooge there, Mo. Uh, that's M-O-E for maintenance of effort. Uh, um, I could go, I'll go on more on that in the uh, Q&A because the, the actual burdens on the states have been well described by, by Leighton and, and Alan. It's just a question as to how you weigh this and in the cautious uh, atmosphere of states who feel like they can't spend one dollar more on Medicaid and in fact they're looking to lighten the load. Uh, that's the reason for a bit of the overshooting as to what this may mean to them in their budgets uh, where they're somewhat uh, tied to the rails uh, without the ability to go where they otherwise would for fiscal reasons. Uh, but we can though uh, at least remain confident uh, that the folks behind the wheel driving this latest version of health reform uh, know what they're doing and will keep us on the road to better health at a lower cost. Uh, then again, uh, it may be a bumpy ride with a more abrupt ending. Thank you. Well, I'm not exactly sure whether I should uh, wear a hat of, as an analyst or as a political hack, so I'll uh, go back and forth a little bit. Um, let me first address the fact that when people say states aren't moving uh, faster, uh, I really think that there are three pretty big challenges. And people have alluded to the, to the fiscal uh, problem, and I just want to talk a little bit more about it because we've done a fair amount of work on it, and it's unfortunate, but the truth of the matter is that this so-called Great Recession was so deep and so wide that it's going to send repercussions throughout state government for virtually 10 years. And that comes in three major components. Uh, we know from the previous downturns that the biggest impact on states is actually one, two, and three years after the recession has been declared over. And that's because the Medicaid growth is very late in the cycle and the maximum loss in income taxes is very, very late uh, in the cycle. We have not even hit the end of that period yet. We will not bottom until 2011 in terms of the state fiscal time. Secondly, we will then enter this jobless recovery uh, period that everybody's talking about and unfortunately seem to be more confirmed in the latest jobs report. Um, we will not hit the 2008 revenue total at states until 2013 or 2014. So essentially, what's happened, our normal growth in revenues over the last 30 years has been 5.6% per year. We will have gone five years without any revenue growth. And what states have done, essentially, is to cut spending by over 11%, and that's not against the old CBO fictitious inflated baseline, that's actually against the actuals. And that's after the recovery package of $135 billion of pretty uh, flexible money. Yeah. Um, and yes, we had lots of problems with the Medicaid expansion. I think it's fairly easy to say, well, it's only 1.2% or so. But I can tell you where the funding is going to come from. We've already raised taxes by $24 billion last year. They're not going to go back and raise taxes again. They can't do it. So where it's going to come from and where it's been coming from for the last five years is cuts in public investment. It's 
coming out of elementary and secondary, it's coming out of higher education, it's coming out of infrastructure. Now, Economics 101 used to tell us, essentially, that public investment is also part of productivity, uh, competitiveness, standard of living, and so on. So our biggest problem was not that healthcare is getting some additional money, but it's where it's coming from. And if those estimates are right, a lot's gonna come out. I mean, a lot of states are not far behind where California is in terms of cuts that are gonna take place uh, in higher ed. Um, the second problem is staff capacity. Um, when governors make uh, budget cuts across the board, they also have to cut the budgets of their governor's offices. And one of the things we have found is that they have cut 11, 12, 15% out of the governor's office, where oftentimes you've got the senior people who can work across agencies to essentially pull this together. So the second problem is, uh, is really experienced senior staff capacity, partly due to budgets, partly due to layoffs, partly due to furloughs, uh, that have been taking place. The third problem is the, is the gubernatorial turnover. Uh, minimum of 24 uh, new governors, uh, possibly 28, 29, or 30 new governors. So essentially, we gotta do this twice, okay? We have to get the, the current governors up to speed as much as possible, particularly around the exchanges, and then we've gotta do some kind of transition. We have to pass the ball to the new people and get this up and operating. Um, and a lot of times, the, you know, they don't keep the, the people who have been involved in it uh, before. So that's going to be a significant problem as well. Um, the other thing I'd like to mention is that I think what's happening here, and I don't think too many people are focusing on it, but I think the whole accountability on healthcare is, is making a transition uh, from the federal government uh, to the states and to the governor. And I talk about that both in terms of financial accountability and political accountability. Um, and again, the, the first problem is Medicaid as a share of the state budget is gonna go up, I think, pretty significantly. Not so much, in all honesty, in the near term uh, because of the increases in Medicaid, but because of the cuts and everything else. As I say, you've already cut $70 billion out of everything else. So it wouldn't surprise me to see Medicaid as a percentage of some state budgets going up from 22 to 26, 27 percent. So governors are going to be on the hook for that in terms of a financial accountability. Second, for those who choose for the state to actually do the exchange, I think that's the part of the market that is going to be very price sensitive. It's where you're going to have small businesses going to be. It's where the individual market is going to be. It's going to be those people who are forced into the component because many of them don't want to get it. They'd rather pay the penalty and, and, and stay out. So that component in the exchange, uh, I think, is going to become the more price sensitive component. Uh, I know a certain number of governors have been defeated over the uh, price of electricity when it goes up 15 or 20 percent. So you're going to see a new political accountability on the rate at which prices move up, particularly in the exchange for those states that do it. Um, to the extent that there's good news, um, I think governors and states are going to be in a stronger position to perhaps work with the industry because when you start adding up the number of people who are going to be in programs overseen one way or the other by governor, uh, it gets up to 120, 130 million if you add the 75 million uh, in the Medicaid after expansion to the 4 million state workers to the 40 to 50 million who may eventually be in the exchanges. All of a sudden, you're at 120 to 130 million people, which is a lar as large as all of the ERISA firms. So all of a sudden, states and governors will come to the table uh, with more uh, potential um, leverage. Um, what we've focused on with governors is obviously the 400-pound gorilla uh, is the exchange, uh, whether they decide to do it or not. Um, the unfortunate parts about it, I would argue that in the short run, <laughs> meaning the first three to four years, no governor is going to get anything out of doing the exchange because there's going to be financial risk. Uh, with re they don't have the money to do it. There's questions about how much money they will, in fact, get to do it. 
Um, you've got to get that up and operating in a fairly short period of time. It's a little bit of an unknown population, and I suspect a lot of the plans are going to say, well, why don't you go first? We're not sure we want to go first to deal with this population. So in some states, you're going to have to encourage uh, plans uh, to come in. And then we've got the issue of the administrative costs and how much are you going to increase the price uh, on premiums due to that. So in the very long run, I think there's a lot of advantages for it. Um, who would want the federal government in the middle of your state? Because I think in a lot of ways, you're going to have the same problems if you've got to integrate the Medicaid with the exchange, and now you've got you running the, the Medicaid program and the federal government running the exchange. You have lots of problems uh, in that anyway. Um, but the truth is, you know, states tend to follow each other, and um, uh, as was said in the previous panel, you know, Massachusetts it's a little different, um, and they're the only ones who's had one up and operating for a period. Uh, and now you've got Utah with a separate one, but they're a little bit different too. Uh, so there's not a lot of roadmaps out there for states in, in terms of, of the exchanges. Uh, but it seems to me that what we're trying to do, work with governors, is to focus on the exchanges now. I think our message to HHS is give some planning money to states now. Uh, let them plan for it. Uh, I think that they need to look at it in a very strategic way as a, uh, a total package. And I think getting the rules and regs out as early as possible would be helpful. And I would say in that particular area, of uh, the more flexibility that states have, the more willing that they will be to take it uh, and run it. Um, Second thing we're sort of working with governors on is that I think one of the second big things that they have to do is start pulling together uh, the plans and providers and start having conversations about um, um, providing data, all payer databases so that you've got a basis to make decisions over the long run, start very early discussions around um, quality, uh, what's going to be included in terms of quality measures. Uh, if we are going to, in fact, move to uh, more weight to medical homes and accountable health organizations and bundled payments and all that kind of stuff, those are things where conversations have to start uh, very, very early. So encouragement to start pulling them together uh, and having um, those conversations. Um, a lot of the insurance reforms uh, and the Medicaid are not going to hit gubernatorial decision making. We do think the systems work on uh, Medicaid is something that's key. Um, I think governors are going to have to prepare for the fact that there will be premium shock in the short run, and who are we going to blame for that? Um, but um, And that gets into the whole issue of communications. I mean, they're going to have to step up to the plate to communicate uh, what they're doing at what point in time. Um, but there's going to be a lot of things that happen that uh, governors are not going to be responsible for uh, during the transition, but that they're essentially going to have to uh, deal with. Um, the only final comment I'll make is that um, this is a very, very big effort. Uh, we went through the recovery package where states got $246 billion. Uh, and we worked with them closely to implement that. But that was an area where you had existing programs that you were working in. Uh, this is creating things from scratch. Uh, so given the fiscal problem, given the staffing problem, given the gubernatorial turnover and the size and magnitude of this, uh, it is, in fact, going to be challenging to get it all done in the time that's necessary. Thank you very much. Well, never let it be said that we don't run a very ecumenical church here at Health Affairs, where we include believers and non-believers alike uh, to discuss uh, many of the issues in health policy. Uh, just to uh, rapidly summarize, clearly what we heard is a difference of opinion on some aspects of this. Uh, Medicaid, Layton describing it as the workhorse of health insurance. Tom Miller pointing out, it, yes, it's also the program that doesn't pay providers enough to get them interested in it. 
obviously that is a core concern over time. We heard a lot of discussion about, again, about the challenges the states are going to face. Ray uh, hitting the, the notes, the low, the low notes, if you will, about the extreme pressure on state revenues with the states not getting back until 2013 or 2014 to the level of tax revenues they were able to collect in 2008, so five years with no revenue growth and the states handling that by cutting back massively in education and infrastructure. We also heard that uh, the states are gonna need a lot of help uh, there was concern about whether the states, whether whether at the state level, the healthcare systems are going to have the capacity to treat 16 million more people on Medicaid. It is, in fact, as Ray said, going to be a huge effort. We heard that there aren't many roadmaps for the states about how to do this. There aren't many roadmaps for the states on how to do exchanges. We heard Alan's call for a dynamic approach to federalism with a lot of interaction between the states and the federal government to balance those concerns about regulations being very tight and prescriptive versus being flexible enough to let the states get to where they need to go. I think it's important to note that we've really come full circle with our discussion today because underlying all of this, what we, we've heard on the last panel, is very much tied to what we heard on the first panel, which is that if this series of reforms works to bend the cost curve by five to seven percent, as Geisinger was able to has been able to achieve in at least some of its business. This all of this is going to be a very different conversation than if that does not occur. It's going to be a very different conversation about the affordability of Medicaid to the states. A very different conversation about how much states have to cut back on education in order to keep feeding the trough of health care, et cetera, et cetera. So I think what we have here is a perfect illustration of why the implementation issues that we have in front of us are so critically important and why we're going to keep at the hard job of covering them uh, and covering the details over time at Health Affairs. In the interest of time, let me just, let's just take one or two questions uh, before we close things off and get you on your way. If there are questions for any of the uh, panelists, if not, I, okay, one, let's take one right here. Again, Michael Cook, a health lawyer uh, in private practice. Uh, what do you think about the possibility of utilizing, uh, for the inner, for inner city health care, utilizing things like CVS Minute Clinics hooked up with community health centers um, as, a, as a possibility to deal with some of the access issues? They have lots of, uh, CVS has lots of stores in the inner city. Um, you can start using um, nurse practitioners for the easy stuff and maybe get community buy-in with the right uh, with the right community meetings. Uh, and we did, uh, let me commend to your attention our primary care issue in May, which took up precisely that topic. Alan? Yeah, I, I, I think it's important to broaden the issue out, not just for the minute clinics, but you know, issues of scope of practice and level of practice. And um, the, the, the real question in all of these bending the curve things is not around payment rates, it's around practice, it's around how we deliver care. And, um, and all the integrated systems, the stories they tell are about changing how they deliver care. And payment is then a mechanism for either supporting changes they were making or making possible changes that weren't otherwise possible, although that's, more, uh, that's rare. Uh, you know, scope of practice, of course, is a state uh, authority, and there are no changes in the federal statute. That's not something that they came along and preempted the states, and I would encourage uh, states to try to have those discussions. Um, we have uh, a lot of variety in how states have approached this issue, medical training. Uh, so I guess I would say um, we, we need a broader strategic approach to uh, supply and access to services. Uh, it's not just finding another set of providers, although that's good, but it's really making more efficient use of the resources we have. And if we think about that from multiple angles, uh, there's a lot we can do. The problem is we've always had a lot we can do, we haven't done it. So the question will be, is this the motivation to actually do it? Tom, do you wanna add anything well, to that? Cheaper, faster, better is always the ambition, but we've 
dealt more people into the card game, all thinking they've got their piece of it. Uh, the idea of living off the land in a less expensive way is going to be an imperative, but I think we've first inflated the ambitions to think that we're not going to have to do that and are going to be rudely surprised when the resources don't match up. So that's exactly one of the routes to go in order to do something simpler, less intensive, but enough to take care of the job. And we're going to have to be more creative in a probably more uh, tightly controlled environment rather than one that's open to those type of innovative approaches. Is there a final question? Yes, right here. One of the uh, things that was mentioned is 30% of all medical care is unnecessary. And there's been no discussion about, I mean, about all the expansion and increase in provided benefits, the expansion of people in access, but nothing about conflicts the industry making the regulations, the industry and those making the regs, the revolving door. And uh, I'm just wondering, even in the care given, that if there's been no discussion about you know, the conflicts and changes, will those things be talked about? Uh I'm not sure that probably was a question that should have, well, we would have liked to have had this, some of the previous panelists here to address that. Uh, but go ahead, Alan. I mean, I think this is the big problem. The, the big problem is there's this sense that somehow everything we talk about isn't that, when in fact, I think everything we're talking about is exactly that. So the, the, there is a direct, and, and may, that's maybe what I was trying to get at when I said we talk about this in these economic modeling, you know, incentives, payment bundling. But it's all about trying methods to address the amount of waste in the system. I mean, that's the dynamic we're trying to unleash. And uh, you can believe or not believe that it will happen, but to say that that's not the discussion, I think, is, is really wrong. Now, this is not a clinical panel. We're not talking about changing the practice, we're talking about changing the environment in which those decisions are made. So that's the link, but that's the, th that link is what plays out on the ground. It doesn't play out at the legislative level. So those discussions are going on all around the country. They're going on at the state level, the local level, inside hospitals, inside physician practices. That is exactly what they're talking about. The question is whether this change yields the kind of change we need. But the notion that these are two separate issues I just think is, is not correct. And those are precisely the issues you will be reading about in health affairs for some years to come. Let me also mention that our July issue also will be implementing health reform part two. So we'll look forward Maybe to having you back uh, perhaps for that one as well. Join me in thanking this panel for a terrific discussion. And thanks to all of you for coming today. Again, thanks to our authors and the support from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Have a good day. <laughs>